in the interest of creating an open dialogue, sit silently and watch this film. Hi, I'm Troy McClure. You may remember me from such educational films as 2 minus 3 equals negative fun and Firecrackers, the silent killer. Mr. McClure? Oh, hello, Bobby. Jimmy. At a time when they're needed more than ever, teachers are instead deserting the profession. In fact, there are now so many of them throwing away their chalk and walking out of the classroom, there are few replacements to fill the void. And that's a significant failure for Australia's future. Demand for substitute teachers continued to rise in Calgary over April, with the Public Board of Education seeing almost 200 unfilled positions per day, and the Catholic Board finding it hard to fill holes despite hiring the most subs they've ever had in five years. It's a strain that can impact other staff at schools and the experience for students as well. This study has been carried out by the Education Policy Institute, which found that schools in England are struggling to attract and maintain science and maths teachers in particular. But the one school essential that's in short supply is the teachers. We're all looking inside the same pool for the same teacher. In Montreal, the student body is growing. While schools can add more spaces, adding teachers is proving more difficult. A growing teacher shortage in the United States leaves educators searching for answers. So a lot of you guys have reached out to me asking about my experience and why I quit teaching. Why teachers quit? Why I quit teaching? All the reasons why I quit teaching. And why I stopped being a teacher in Chicago. I am one of those teachers who's not in the classroom right now. And it's partly COVID-ish, but it, there's a lot of other factors. It's time for them to graduate from Bovine University. Come on, Jimmy. Let's take a peek at the killing floor. <gasps> Don't let the name throw you, Jimmy. It's not really a floor. It's more of a steel grating that allows material to sluice through so it can be collected and exported. <laughs> Getting hungry, Jimmy? Let me state at once what the three objects are for which we need educators. People must learn to see, they must learn to think, and they must learn to speak and to write. The object of all three of these pursuits is a noble culture. Just ask this scientician. Uh, he'll tell you that in nature, one creature invariably eats another to survive. Wow, Mr. McClure, I was a grade-A moron to ever question. <laughs> yes, you were, Jimmy. Yes, you were. Um, you're hurting me. And people are like, what can we do to fix it? I'm not going to lie to you. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, after I posted my experience and, you know, what happened, I had people from all over this country reaching out to me telling me y'all's experience, and we're all in the same boat. Education is an absolute shit show. It is a walking shit show. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to offend anybody. Over my eight years of teaching, I've met really great people. I've had really great coworkers. I've had some really great students. I've met some really great parents. I've had some great administrators. So a part of me is kind of afraid to make this video because I don't want somebody that knows me in any of those capacities to find this and feel like I'm talking bad about them. Daddy, how come you're not at work? I don't know. How come you're not at school? My teacher says she's tired of trying. Yeah, well, so am I, Ralphie. So am I. So a day later, I felt a million times better. A couple weeks later, I felt even better. And now it's over a year, and I cannot believe I waited so long to actually walk out of that job. When I grow up, I'm going to Bovine University. A passage about Teachers College in New York explains one reason why that's a problem. These student teachers are being encouraged to transform a world they know almost nothing about. They know next to nothing of past disasters or triumphs or present mistakes. Sure of themselves as only those ignorant of history can be, they feel no need for tolerance of their own imperfect but relatively free society. All they know is that it isn't everything it should be. To them, that seems enough evidence for indictment. In 1991, when this was written, the damage graduates from teacher training schools could do was limited to the K-12 public school system, which was bad enough. 
But what might these graduates do if they were appointed to administrative positions in universities with control over hundreds of thousands of college students? They don't even understand the basics of history, reading, writing, math, anything like that, okay? And this video right here, again, shows you how ignorant some of the young people in this country are. Again, this video is going to interview young people in New York City. And again, this is just an absolute disaster. It's embarrassing. Let's get into it. I'll give you one dollar if you can name any continents. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know a continent. If I did, I would say it. What century are we in? 20. Yes. If you're driving 60 miles an hour and you drive for one hour, how far do you end up traveling? Um, I don't know. I'm not good at math. <laughs> Two hours? Justin here, and today we're in the beautiful Times Square in New York City doing a collab with Fleckus Talks. We're just going to go around and ask people, if they, see if they know anything at all. Can you name the continents? When I was in the classroom, I just, there were so many things I would get so frustrated over, but I just felt like I couldn't tell the truth. And one of my core values is honesty and truth. And so it was just really difficult, not feeling like I had support, not really finding a lot of people that were willing to talk about some of the hard stuff. I believe that when people say, cause one of the first things, the number one reason that they give in surveys and studies that people quit is they'll say they quit because they had a lack of administrative support. And I believe what they mean by a lack of administrative support is that uh, the students were acting up in my room. I couldn't get the students to act right. Little, you know, Johnny did this. And then I called in an administrator and, you know, nothing changed. Little Johnny either didn't get the discipline that I felt he deserved or he got put in in school suspension and he came back and he acted the same way or he got put in out of school suspension and he came back and he acted the same way and he's just totally making it where I cannot teach in my class and that's one of the things I have seen people come in and quit teaching on the first day I have seen all kind of you know YouTube videos where people talk about I don't know how anybody can do this these kids are horrible you know that kind of thing I have seen people quit in the first week I have seen subs leave during the middle of the day I have seen all those situations in all the different schools that I have worked at uh, as, an, as a teacher and as an administrator and I do believe that's one of the big things student behavior is an issue now nobody wants to say that nobody wants to say bad things about kids or kids don't know how to act you know that it's like what what can we do because admin is scared of county office County office is scared of these parents. These parents are scared of their kids and the kids ain't scared of nobody. And I'm like, what, what kind of system? We can't work in these kind of situations. And it's like every excuse is made for the child. That's not right. I'm a grown ass woman. It ain't no reason I should have to tell a child, do not put your hands on me. Why should I have to look at a child and say, don't put your hands on me? What child teaching them at home that they think it's okay to try to put their hands on the teacher? Nobody wants to be a person that has to say that. And I'm not, you know, blaming it all on the kids by any means. The way society is now with a lot of these students, I mean, if you go home and your parents have no respect for any authority whatsoever, they have no respect for the government, they have no respect for the police, they have no respect for clergy, they have no respect for teachers, they, you know, those kids are not going to come in your room and come into your you know, domain and come in there and act right. They have no respect for their parents. They have no fear of their parents. Nobody makes them act any certain way. They can act the way they want at home, stuff like that. And they come into a public or private school room situation and they're gonna to continue to act the way that they act. And the sad reality is with teachers today is you, you have to be prepared to deal with those kind of students. They are going to be in your classroom and there's nothing you can do about them being in your classroom. And the girl called herself coming back to apologize. It was the most backwards apology I had ever heard. And the child looked me dead in my face. A 13 year old, look, I'm a 32 year old woman. 13 year old looked me dead in my face and said, if they would have took me out of here in handcuffs, when I came back, me and you would have got to fighting for real. Girl. <clears throat> Nobody cares about education. 
Now you can go all the way down the line through all the things that people you typically hear about teachers complaining about, lack of resources, not enough pay, the workload that they have to take home. All of these things kind of encompass the fact that nobody really cares about teaching. This leads to just a general apathy in the education system, a lack of innovation, no funding for certain programs. They're actually still cutting out art, cutting out music. They're slowly but surely trying to shorten the school year so that they don't have to pay those expenses and all for the name of dollar amount. It has nothing to do with the teacher or the student. It has everything to do with money. So we can go all the way, start from the Department of Education all the way down to a school district, but nobody really, really is taking a care for what is going on in the schools. And as a result, you can see the decline of public education in the United States. To learn to see, to accustom the eye to calmness, to patience, and to allow things to come up to it, to defer judgment, and to acquire the habit of approaching and grasping an individual case from all sides. This is the first preparatory schooling of intellectuality. One must not respond immediately to a stimulus. One must acquire a command of the obstructing and isolating instincts. To learn to see, as I understand this matter, amounts almost to that which in popular language is called strength of will. Its essential feature is precisely not to wish to see, to be able to postpone one's decision. These schools are an absolute zoo. All of them are an absolute zoo. And I'm like, people are like, what's the solution? Bro, I don't know, but some of y'all parents, how are y'all parents and y'all kids? Because they are terrible. Now, the parents that are supportive, we appreciate y'all, but the majority of y'all, y'all ain't worth two rusty nickels. Y'all kids bad, and y'all kids disrespectful. They ain't got no respect for authority whatsoever, and they don't care. They think everything is funny. Teachers having to break down y'all kids last week. It's not right, man. It's not right. I'm trying to figure out what kind of kids y'all raising. Number two is that there is a parenting crisis. The parenting crisis, and this is, granted, I'm in my bubble, the school districts that I've worked at and the students that I've worked with and the environment that I'm in, I see a lot of these same things and I see a lot of these parents not really holding their kids accountable, number one. The parents are guilty that if they discipline their child, if they're harsh toward their child, even if they make a mistake in judgment with their child, that their kid is not gonna like them. So as a result, they don't discipline them. They wanna be the kid's friend. Now, translate this to teaching. You bring a classroom of 30 kids and you get a good percentage of them who don't have any accountability at home. The teacher is left with holding the bag of trying to not only teach the kid, but also to parent the kid as well. Uh, the administration is not holding the kids accountable at all either, because I've worked in both public, charter, and independent private and private schools. And the main thread throughout those schools, they have to have enrollment numbers and they have to have people coming to that school. Because the administration has to deal with the fact that if they piss off the parent, the parent can say, well, I'm gonna take my kid out of the school or I'm gonna report this to the district. And that is detrimental to the school organization. So what they'll do is they'll find any excuse they can to keep the kids butt in the seats. And normally what that means is the buck gets passed to the teacher. I remember going to a professional development last year and the premise was that giving zeros are toxic to students. Really, it's kind of complicated, but the idea that everything that we've done in terms of traditional grading is pretty much totally wrong. Being in a school year where about 75 to 87 percent of my students were turning in absolutely nothing, <laughs> it was a little bit discouraging for me to hear that giving zeros are toxic. And I think I must have entered education at a really weird time period, but there has been so many shocking philosophies to me that <laughs> make zero sense. Hooray! Everyone's a winner! And I know that I know that I know that it makes zero sense to, you know, 97% of the teachers in the room, yet I would proceed to watch those teachers stand up and say, oh my goodness, I never knew that giving zeros were toxic. Thank you so much for coming to the school and telling me that. And I'm not trying to be a brat really, but that got under my skin so bad. <laughs> I felt like a lot of the policies that have been happening are all fear-driven. 
They're not being made with the interest of the teachers. They're not being made for the interest of the students or families. It's mostly about not getting sued, not being on the wrong side of the media, not upsetting people that have power. It's just been a mess. And I have routinely felt like teachers are the last people that are considered in a lot of these decisions and philosophies that are happening. And that's another thing that kind of has made me want to leave. I feel like common sense has gone completely out the window. And I think that that is true, especially with how schools treat students. At the end of the day, I have felt like there's little very little accountability for students and I haven't really felt like there's productive ways of disciplining students and I do think it's human nature that if you're in an environment where you're not held accountable there aren't really consequences for your actions people are going to tend to not be the best versions of themselves let me put it that way and that's true whether you are in fourth grade or whether you are 45. People need structure, they need accountability, they need someone calling them to a higher standard. First, let's take the subject of low academic standards, which has been a problem with ed schools for a century, even at the most prestigious institutions. In 1933, for example, Harvard President Lawrence Lowell described Harvard's own education school as a kitten that ought to be drowned. In the decades that followed, many schools like Yale, Duke, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Chicago did drown their ed schools, if not completely, at least partially by scaling them back. Though Harvard's own ed school remains undrowned, in 1969, the dean and associate dean of Harvard's ed school admitted that the prevailing climate in the nation's teacher training schools was anything but intellectual. Study, reflection, debate, careful reading, even, yes, serious thinking, they wrote, is often conspicuous by its absence. Weak programs tend to attract weak students. One thing that was really hard for me as a teacher is that I never really felt like I could share the truth about what I was experiencing in the classroom. I also never really felt free to share when I disagreed with decisions that, you know, the school district was making or the building was making. It really felt like in education, my professional opinion wasn't valued at all. And it's one of the few professions where most of the people have master's degrees, but they're treated as if they don't know anything about their trade. In professional development meetings, it was really clear that teachers that did speak up were sort of blacklisted <laughs> and they were disliked by administration and they had horrible reputations and I'm a person that tries to be somewhat <laughs> likable and agreeable and I didn't want to be that person that was disliked by my administrators so I just felt a huge pressure to smile and nod but as I mentioned earlier that is not in my nature to lie. That's an issue and the state has been uh, kind of scrambling for years and years to make sure that we have enough teachers. And I'm not gonna go through all the results, but one result that I wanna talk about today, the number three reason that people chose for why they were leaving had to do with the level of participation in decisions related to the profession. All these decisions are being made for what teachers do in their classrooms and in their job, and they are not involved. Now, a lot of you people uh, may have jobs where you don't need, you know, your job is, is, is kind of dictated to you and you have to do it in a certain way. You don't need a level of freedom. I just need to know what I do and I do this and I don't need to be making decisions. I just need to do my job. That's not how teaching works. The kids this year, they don't know how to play with each other. They don't know how to stop playing with each other. They don't know how to sit down, be quiet, to not call their teacher's name a hundred times. We have had to reacclimate them to being in school again. Some of them haven't been in school for two years. I, I don't understand why we're just picking back up business as usual. We are absolutely dog tired and exhausted. We have to do something because what we're doing is not working. So, you never learned cursive? Well, I know hell or damn and bit. Uh, cursive handwriting, script. Do you know the multiplication tables? Long division? I know of them. 
Mm. You know, Bart, I think you'd profit from a more remedial environment. I'm sure you'll feel right at home in the Leg Up program. Can you name the continents? What the f***? No? It's like, isn't it like Alaska? Oh, I got it right! You see Alaska! Oh, my bitch. Uh, uh, New Jersey? Alaska. Yeah. Ah, you see Alaska? So you got Alaska, New Jersey. Hawaii? Yes. What's six times seven? Six times seven? Yeah. 28. What does Y-E-S spell? Y-E-S? Yeah. Y-E-S. I don't know. What the f***? <laughs> what? You say. What does Y-E-S spell? Wes, right? Wes? Wes? <laughs> Seven times six? Six times seven. 48. You try to Yes. I'll give you one dollar if you can name a single continent. Yes. <laughs> Who did we gain our independence from? I don't know. Didn't they go to war? <laughs> yeah, who did we fight against? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Bruh. Again, they don't even know basic things like six times seven, which is 42. Right? Oh, who do we uh, gain independence from? Great Britain. Uh, I don't know. We fought everybody. <laughs> right? Can you name a continent? Okay, I don't know. Uh, North America. <laughs> right? They, I don't know. I can't name a continent. Alaska. Hawaii. The worst part about these guys is that these people can vote. <laughs> right? I know literacy tests are probably unconstitutional. But I'm telling you, man, I definitely think that we need a basic civics test to be able to vote and a basic financial literacy test to be able to run for office, right? I would totally be down for that. Uh, even though I do know it's unconstitutional, but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I probably would keep my mouth closed if somebody proposed something like that. I wouldn't push back too hard because this is ridiculous. This is out of control, right? It, there's no excuse for not even having a basic knowledge of the things this guy is asking. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps, and uh, I believe that our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and. I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Uh, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries. So we will be able to build up our future for our children. Thank you very much, South Carolina. So what are you in for? I moved here from Canada and they think I'm slow, eh? I fell off the jungle gym and when I woke up I was in here. I start fires. Okay. Now everyone take out your safety pencil and a circle of paper. This week, I hope we can finish our work on the letter A. Head Start has been, uh, has been more or less untouchable uh, for many years, primarily because members of Congress are sympathetic to programs for children. And Head Start over the years has been built up as one of the you know, probably the only really successful war on poverty program, or one of the only successful war on poverty programs. And over the years, every time someone tried to even criticize Head Start, then there was an onslaught of people who said, you know, it doesn't work. A second thing, or it's a good program and be quiet. And a second factor that I think is really important is that the evidence has been pretty equivocal. You could not make a strong case that Head Start produces these wonderful impacts. But you could make a moderate case, and you could make a moderate case that it didn't produce very good impacts. And in this regard, I think the real turning point was that a bunch of the states, 42 to be exact, created their own preschool programs, primarily for poor kids. Some of them are universal, all kids go, but mostly they're for poor kids. Now, why would the states do that since Head Start already has, is a program for poor kids? So the states were thinking it's not performing that well either. It's been 10 years since the No Child Left Behind Act was passed by Congress and signed by President Bush. Today, its performance is beyond dispute. The act came with a massive infusion of new federal spending and federal control, 
but student achievement has been flat and states have less flexibility today than before the act was passed. A big investment without much measurable return. Politicians have traditionally hidden behind three things, the flag, the Bible, and children. No child left behind. No child left behind. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't long ago you were talking about giving kids a head start. Head start, left behind. Someone's losing fucking ground here. But there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks. And it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got, because the owners of this country don't want that. All right, first academic alert, Wiggum Ralph. I won! I won! No, no, Ralph, this means you're failing English. Me fail English? That's impossible. Okay, so up first, system problems. I think America is fooling itself. I love my country and I love being an American, don't get me wrong, but there is a huge difference between what we say we value and what we actually value in practice. So we say as Americans that we believe in determination and hard work and self-sacrifice and yet we actually tilt toward what's fast and easy and most comfortable. And so I see this in lots of things, not, not just within education, although I see it here too. I see it in the, you know, the way we take care of our health, right? So we say we value healthy living, but we don't do the hard work of taking care of ourselves, right? The getting out and being physically active. And I understand about balance, don't lecture me, I know, but it tends to be that we go for what's easy. America, we say we are, this is, ugh. We are say we are one nation, indivisible, but we're really divided. We're not one nation. We're a bunch of different nations and a bunch of different competing interests and we haven't figured it out yet. We say we believe in liberty, justice for all. There's a lot of injustice in our world. So again, the chasm between what we say we are and what we say we value and what we actually are and what we actually value in practice. And I see this in education too. We say we value education, but we don't fund it. We don't respect it, right? Like we, we have class sizes of 35 kids. You tell me you want me to make great writers and critical thinkers, but oftentimes it feels like I am crowd control, <laughs> right? So not having the resources to do the job right has been a source of frustration for me for a long time. So class sizes are crazy. There's no money for the supplies that we need to do our job. That's on the teacher's back. Our own salaries we dip into to buy the things that our kids need, which there's no other job that I know of where Professionals have to like bring in their own stuff to do the job that the boss needs them to do. So that's a problem. The curriculum is just tired and out of date. There's nothing innovative happening there. It's just the, the system that was purchased 15 years ago and has been in the back cabinet and we just use what we've always used because that's what we have. It's frustrating to me that culturally, teachers are held up as heroes and then six weeks later are torn down as villains. Right? Like once COVID hit and remote learning started happening and parents actually saw like, the scope of what we were doing every day, they were amazed, but then very quickly irritated that it was on their shoulders. It's hard. The structure of school hasn't evolved to match the realities of the world today, right? Like we're still using that industrial revolution model of, you know, the kids in the rows for the set number of hours, you do one hour of math, one hour of, you know, English, one hour of history, um, and we just switch, switch, switch. And the brain, you know, does it learn that way best? I don't think so, right? But we're so locked into this structure that to change it would be revolutionary. And so kids are frustrated with the system, teachers are frustrated with the system, but we have to work within the system we have. And for me, there's a lot of tension in that. Like, I don't like complaining about things I, unless I have a solution. But the problem is I don't know how to fix this. I don't have a solution to like change the entire American public school education system structures. 
this is something that's really unpopular to talk about, but you know, over my years of teaching, I've known a lot of teachers that make up scores and make up data because they are, you know, really a big deal with observations and with, you know, how your end of the year evaluation comes up. So a lot of teachers just felt like they were forced to end up making up numbers and making up data. And to me, it just goes into this giant feeling of the lie culture within teaching where, you know, you keep your mouth shut, you pretend you agree with everything, you don't try to make the wrong people mad, you feel like you've got to lie to parents, you feel in some cases like you've got to make up test scores. It just was so crazy. I felt like I was kind of like living in an Orwellian nightmare a lot of times because there's just so many things that didn't add up and didn't make sense, but yet I didn't feel free to say anything. And if I did, which sometime I did, I ended up feeling like I was highly resented for it and then kind of in some subtle ways punished for it. I just want to teach. I just want to take a kid from here to here, have them not love writing, and then actually be proud of a piece of writing that they created. Like, I just want it to be organic like that. And I know it's kind of hippy dippy, I know, but so when I was a younger teacher, I'd say around year five, years five through eight, I was really into data. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out this system. I'm gonna tweak what I do in my class and then measure results. And what I found is that different classes responded differently to different strategies and approaches. Go figure. And so teaching is an art. It is not a science. There is no formula. There's no um, guaranteed output. It's not a factory. These aren't widgets. These are human children <laughs> and they're human teachers teaching them. And so for all of our flaws and differences and craziness, that's all part of the mix. And so it's an art figuring out how to help this kid find a book that she really loves for the first time ever, or how to help this kid have the self-confidence to get up and speak in front of a group of peers for the first time without feeling like they're gonna pass out. Like, there are wonderful moments that happen that aren't measured by a statistic on a data spreadsheet. The problem with all of that is that I, it's hard for me to hide my disdain. I don't have a poker face. So when I am required to get kids hyped for the state test, I cannot do that in a convincing way anymore. I tried. I tried to be a good soldier. I really did. But the kids know. I don't care. And I think you know where we're going with this, right? In society, and especially in a classroom environment where there might be over 30 students, there has to be some kind of order, rule, and structure, and the teacher is responsible for setting those rules and enforcing those rules. When students inherently don't have any kind of respect for rules or authority, we have the situation in a lot of modern classes today. Teachers can't get through their lesson because students are constantly interrupting. Teachers are having to waste time over classroom procedures because even though they've been taught dozens of times, students are refusing to follow through with them. Students aren't listening when the teacher is talking, <laughs> so then they have no idea what they're supposed to be doing by the time the assignment comes. Now, people that are not familiar with how modern schools work will just say, well, that student should just get in trouble. But that's the problem. In modern education, there really is no way for students to get in trouble for the most part. There's been these kind of wacky Pollyanna discipline theories. Hooray! Everyone's a winner! That really kind of have gotten rid of things like detention or suspension or even missing recess or anything that people used to do in the past to kind of be a deterrent to bad behavior. So students are really in a position where they really don't have any kind of consequences that are impeding their desire to do whatever they want. Other people would say, well, why don't you just let that student fail if they're not interested in learning? But in modern education, teachers actually get in trouble when students fail. And that, I would say, is one of the biggest differences between modern education and past education. Even when I was going to school, if I didn't study for a test, my teacher wasn't in trouble. The grade and the content was my responsibility to learn whether or not 
I felt like the teacher instructed in a way that I preferred. However, these days, literally everything is blamed on teachers. We're responsible for students' test scores, even if they've chosen not to study. We get in trouble and re reprimanded if we are sending students to the office. And there's even another layer of feeling like we're in trouble when we're trying to contact students' parents, because these days, a lot of times, the parents will actually get mad at us and try to argue and fight with us and try to go above our heads and make our job in jeopardy for having complaints about their students. And these are all the reasons that I eventually ended up quitting after eight years of teaching. General administrative overwhelming amount of work that we give teachers. The second one was about student behavior. Today I'm going to talk about lack of respect. I believe a lot of teachers leave the profession. They don't find it very satisfying because of lack of respect. People want to have a job where they feel like they're making a difference. They feel like their employee wants some. That, and you would think, well, teaching ought to be easy, you know, to, to feel that way. I mean, because, you know, you, you, these kids are all learning and all this. But on the other hand, there are things about it that make it very, very difficult to feel like they're really having the impact that they want to have. Now, the most obvious thing, you know, area of, of, of where you would see disrespect is from the students. And it's not every student. And, oh, and, you, and you get used to it. If you can't get used to it, you can't teach. If you can't deal with, you know, some 12 year old cussing you out, then you're not gonna make it in education. And you're gonna have a hard time uh, because it's gonna happen. And you know, if you're gonna be in high school, you're gonna see it in middle school, you're gonna see it a lot more in middle school and high school. If you're gonna be an administrator, I mean, you're gonna get called names. You're gonna get cussed out. You're gonna get, you know, just total disrespect. And, you know, you just got to realize, hey, they're kids. You know, the kids know nothing's going to happen to them. You know, really, you can do whatever punishment it is, but it's not really a punishment. Putting them in out of school suspension is not a punishment to them. They're glad to get to stay at home. So it's just one of those things. If you can't deal with that, then you can't, you know, you just can't be in education. You, you've got to be able to deal with that. So, and I always looked at that as like, well, they're kids, and I don't think it's anything personal. They're just being kids. They, they care less whether it's me or somebody else. They just don't like the authority. Now, the one that bothered me more than that was disrespect from uh, parents. A lot of parents have a very low view of the education system. They have a very low view of the education system in their area. They don't like teachers. They don't like, you know, a lot of them, like the kids will do okay in elementary school and then they'll get to middle school and all of a sudden they'll start having trouble. And then they'll, you know, the first thing a lot of parents want to do is they want to blame the teacher. And they look at it like it's just like a consumer mentality. Uh, like the teacher owes my son. You owe my son an education and you need to give it to him. It's not my problem, it's your problem. You're the one, you know, y'all make him come to school and y'all got all these, so it's you. There was also a huge difference in my values and the students' values, especially related to education. Definitely differed from school to school, but in many of the schools that I worked at, I found out that my students really didn't value my subject at all. I taught English, ELA, English language arts, and it was often one of the least favorite subjects of my students. And so I found that often they just would not do the work. Me fail English? That's impossible. It's on you, you gotta, and if you can't do it, then there's something wrong with you, you know. Or when you have to have a conference because the teacher told the girl she had to change seats at lunch and the girl, you know, wouldn't do it because the teacher wouldn't give her a good enough reason for her to change. When you gotta have a con, you know, and then the parents wanna know, well, why would you move, you know. If a teacher can't tell a kid where to sit, you don't have a school. I mean, you just don't. You don't. You don't have a society. You know, when you can't, when people in positions of authority cannot tell somebody where to sit or stop, or hey, could you go this way, please? Because there's a wreck over here. When you can't give directions for safety and for order you don't have a society. That's gonna be conflicting with a lot of the values that I hoped to impart to my students, which was ethical behavior, kindness, respect, hard work, 
grit and determination, all of those things. But it was as if I was speaking a totally different language. I wasn't trying to be an authoritarian nightmare for students. I just wanted them to do basic things like not talk when they weren't supposed to, listen, cooperate with each other, follow basic directions, whether they were school rules or classroom rules. And my objective was never to create drones that just unquestionably follow commands. I actually really focused a lot on critical thinking skills, debate, persuasion, all of the things that you would hope that a student would get at school. But too often, I just noticed that in this modern time, people think in such extremes that they think it's impossible to facilitate critical thinking while also teaching kids to be respectful of their teachers and their principals, to be respectful of rules when they're not at home. People set those two things in opposition as if they can't both exist at the same time. But my belief, and it hasn't changed, is that they must both exist at the same time or else you have a society that's collapsing, which I think most of us can agree that's kind of what's been happening over the last few years. And at the end of the day, I didn't want to be a part of that. No amount of money was worth that to me because I ultimately felt like now I was taking place in a system that ultimately wasn't good for students. And that is why I quit teaching. We're going to take a test. Oh. We're going to take a test. All right, a test. It's called the Career Aptitude Normalizing Test, or CANT. Some of you may discover a wonderful vocation you never even imagined. Others may find out life isn't fair. In spite of your masters from Bryn Mawr, you might end up a glorified babysitter to a bunch of dead-eyed fourth graders while your husband runs naked on a beach with your marriage counselor. Well, that was a waste of time. Jamie, school is never a waste of time. Since we have 15 minutes until recess, please put down your pencils and stare at the front of the room. Right away, they start talking about education. That's the big answer to everything. Education. They said, we need more money for education. We need more, more, more books, more teachers, more classrooms, more schools. Uh, we need more testing for the kids. And you say to them, well, you know, we've tried all of that, and the kids still can't pass the test. They say, ah, oh, don't you worry about that. We're going to lower the passing grades. Take a guess. What country? Korea. <laughs> yes. The 69th president of the United States of America. 69th? Uh... Richard Nixon? Yes. How many make up one dozen? How many make up one dozen? 100? 100. <laughs> yes. What is Obama's last name? Obama. Care. 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 Like C-A-R-E. Obama's last name, the president. Care. If you're oh driving 60 God. miles an hour and you drive for one hour, how far do you travel? A mile. <laughs> yes. I'll give you this dollar if you can name one continent. USA. Continent. I don't know. Congratulations. <laughs> 60 miles an hour and you drive for one hour. How far do you travel? One mile. Who fought in the Civil War? Soldiers. Hey, I guess that's right. Who against who? Um, America and France. Who fought in the Civil War? I'm, I don't know that one. Oh. I don't know. Take a guess. Who against who? Civil War. You know this. Not. You should know it. You don't know who fought for your uh for your ancestors' freedom, <laughs> right? Assuming that you know, he's a descendant of slaves. I don't know. I'm just making a joke here. That you know. Uh, again, it's a shame that you don't you don't even know that history of who who fought on what side uh for slavery, right? In order to free slaves. So we need to try to figure out how to create education better so that we can solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Utah. Thank you, sweetheart. In 1932, an influential professor of education at Teachers College by the name of George Counts published a pamphlet whose title was a question, Dare the School Build a New Social Order? His answer was a resounding and confident yes. Counts had been so impressed by the socialist indoctrination he'd seen firsthand in Soviet schools in the late 20s that he urged American public school teachers to follow the Soviet lead, to make their students into good collectivist progressives too. What they should not be making students into was the non-political college professor who, and I quote, can balance the pros against the cons with the skill of a juggler who sees all sides of every question and never commits himself to any.
What George Counts assumes is that someone like Harvard professor Sandel in his course on justice, who doesn't broadcast his own political views, must not have any, and that students taught by such a professor won't develop any. Both assumptions are obviously false. Such a non-committal professor like Sandel may be deeply committed to an impartial analysis of the subject because of a still deeper political commitment to the right of his students to hear all sides of a complex question so that they can form their own judgments about what justice means. But Counts's ed school authoritarian streak is alive and well 90 years later. Consider an essay published the same year that Professor Sandel's course at Harvard was first broadcast on television in 2009. The title of the essay is Developing Social Justice Literacy. All lack of intellectuality, all vulgarity arises out of the inability to resist a stimulus. One must respond or react. Every impulse is indulged. In many cases, such necessary action is already a sign of morbidity, of decline, and a symptom of exhaustion. Almost everything that coarse popular language characterizes as vicious is merely that psychological inability to refrain from reacting. As an instance of what it means to have learnt to see, let me state that a man thus trained will, as a learner, have become generally slow, suspicious, and refractory. With hostile calm, he will first allow every kind of strange and new thing to come right up to him. He will draw back his hand at its approach. To stand with all the doors of one's soul wide open. To lie slavishly the dust before every trivial fact, at all times of the day, to be strained, ready for the leap, in order to deposit oneself, to plunge oneself into other souls and other things, in short, the famous objectivity of modern times is bad taste, it is essentially vulgar and cheap. I gotta roll my sleeves up for this teaching story. This one's unreal. Strap in, you ready? So, I leave teaching for just a little bit to pursue comedy, and then I decide to come back. Well, the pandemic just started, and I find myself in a brand new school. Now, I'm teaching online. I got the kids, they're online. We're, we're hitting it hard. We're doing online curriculum, full Google Classroom, the works. My students are working hard, some of them. Some aren't working hard at all. Some don't even show up. You know how it is. Anyways, this is the last part of the school year, but I have a full semester with them, and I've got grades going on. I'm making phone calls to parents, and the end of the year's coming. Three weeks before the end of the year, we get an email that says that all the students must get a grade no less than the grade they had the previous nine weeks. So if they got a B last nine weeks and they have an F this nine weeks, they can't get anything less than that B. And of course, the students heard about that and decided to basically stop doing all work, but that's beside the point. So I look in my grade book and I say, you know, I got some kids, A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever. All the letters are in my grade book. And I check out the previous nine weeks and you're not gonna believe what I found. A's, not just a few A's, a lot of A's. A lot of A's, a lot, a lot, a lot of A's. In fact, every one of my 120 students had an A. Not just an A, a 100 A. Not a single student scored less than a 100 the last nine weeks. And I think to myself, this is obviously an error. There's no way all these students had a 100 A. Even students that never showed to class. I looked at the attendance, they, they weren't there. So they earned 100 A and never once came to class. So I message, I say, it's gotta be an error. An assistant principal responds to me and says, oh yeah, it looks like, you know, somebody made a mistake. Uh, you know what though, we just gotta go with it. So all your students, go ahead and correct the grades. What? I have students that have never shown. I have students that have defiantly not shown saying, I'm not doing that. 
Now they get a 100A, a 100A. I got students that have done the work and they're gonna get the same grade as those students that just didn't, I, that just makes no sense to me. I argued it with them. I said, no, I said, assistant principal, you gotta be kidding me. Somebody has made a grave mistake. We need to find out who it is. Check the grade books, make sure that, you know, something wasn't inputted wrong. And, and she said, no, no, just go ahead. You do it, just put it in. We're not going through all that. I fought this until they stopped responding to emails and I find fine, fine. So I put in the A's and you know what? I get an email the next day from administration saying I didn't put the grades in correctly because I had students that had 98 and 96 and 97. Those needed to be corrected to 100 because it wasn't a high enough A that I was falsely giving some of them. So I'm livid, I, I don't understand it. Or how every student can pass, that makes no sense whatsoever. And I decide to do a little bit of detective work. And it turns out when I put in my grade, I can see that I put in the grade. And I said, you know what? Maybe I can see who this culprit is. Maybe I can see who has been messing with my grade book from last semester and gave them all 100s. Maybe I can see who they are, because if it's another teacher, if it's a substitute, I don't want them ever in my class because they're giving A's to people that aren't even there. So I do, I, I researched it. I looked and there was a name. There was a name next to every single 100A. And that name was the name of the assistant principal that told me just to ignore it. Somebody probably made a mistake. They were the one that inputted the grade the last nine weeks and gave everybody 100. Kids that never even showed 100. I couldn't believe it. And then I messaged them. I said, hey, uh, just so you know, I saw your name next to this. Uh, you know, you were the one that gave him the grade. You think I heard back? No. But, you know, I did get that email from the county just a few weeks later saying that our graduation rate was higher than it had ever been. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, it is? You don't say. Oh, the things you hear while teaching. The things you see while teaching. An alarming problem we've been reporting on now for months. Hundreds of teachers have told us what's happening in their classrooms. We're talking about elementary school students. They're having outbursts. They can't control their emotions. They lash out, sometimes violently. Teachers have sent us pictures and videos. How do you, one little boy? They show destroyed classrooms, bruises caused by students. Some can't take it anymore and have left the profession altogether. Educators tell me they feel like they're failing their students, like the whole system is failing our kids. They're fed up and demanding action. So we asked a group of teachers, parents, administrators, and lawmakers to join us here at Union Pine in Southeast Portland. This is a conversation about where we go from here. No more simply telling you what's happening. Now, let's try to solve this. Originally, I got into education. I was very passionate. I really wanted to be able to give back. I wanted to be able to impact the youth and make a difference in their lives so that they can go off to college and do amazing things. And that didn't happen. It didn't, it didn't quite happen. It didn't quite pan out that way. I realized when I got into the, to the school system, I ran into like hella issues. It was just so difficult working in that environment, primarily when most of the staff I could not relate to, like my supervisors and bosses, because they were all Caucasian, uh, white. They, they were white. I don't even use Caucasian. I don't even know why I said that. They were white. And I found myself consistently trying to tell them certain things culturally about the students, and they just did not want to listen. Like, they did not think that what I had to say was of any value or anything that I had to say was valid. And I don't know if it was because I was a less experienced teacher. I don't know if it was because I looked 14. Like, I don't, I don't know. But I always found myself struggling to have my voice heard. And I was always fighting on behalf of the students for stuff to happen at the school or for a culture to change or for this to happen. And it was just so, it was too much, man. Like, I actually, realized like at a certain point that I was kind of going through the motions and the worst thing that you want to find in a school system is a teacher that's just going through the motions. That's the worst 
thing. Like I went to a public high school in Chicago, a Chicago public school. And I remember being in high school, early 2000s, I had teachers that just went through the motions. Like we would come in a classroom, we could do whatever we want to. And the teacher just sitting there with a newspaper and like, just don't kill each other. Like that was the whole attitude, the whole atmosphere of the school. And so for me, I was like, man, I, I'm never gonna be that person. I'm never gonna be that teacher that just gives up and it's just, just be on autopilot. Like while wow, stuff is happening and just picking up a check every two weeks and it is what it is. Um, and then I started to feel myself kind of fall into that. Like I would wake up in the morning and I'm like, man, I would sit on the edge of my bed and stare at the wall for about seven seconds. Like, Man, I'm so tired of these kids, man. But first, before we try to solve it, we really have to understand. We want people to understand what's happening in classrooms. So teachers, I want to start with you. Tell me the classroom disruptions you're seeing in your classroom and in your school. I have seen chairs thrown. I have had fights. I've had threats. I've had scissors thrown at me. My room completely trashed. Other students had violence towards them. I've been hit with a stick. Anything from terrible language to room clears to tables and chairs all being turned over, laptops being thrown around, fists through windows. This yeah. is elementary school. This is elementary school. Teachers across Oregon sent us pictures of what these rooms would look like after an outburst. There would be tables thrown. The rooms were trashed. Is this something that happens? Absolutely. Yes. All the time? Pretty consistently. Uh, injuries? Any teachers being hurt? Lots. Lots of teachers going to the emergency room. Kids getting hurt. It was a pretty constant basis. Shyla? Yeah, I mean, I can speak personally to the fact that I am actually on medical leave. I'm on partial medical leave because of PTSD because of my classroom this year. My second grader, though, has seen physical pain to her as well. I know it happens with the teachers, but she's been choked twice. Her hair has been pulled down in kindergarten to the, you know, she's been pulled down to the ground and choked, and they could hardly get the other child off of her. Tear bulletin boards down, and we're told not to touch them, not to do anything. I couldn't even talk to kids in my room. I had to call the vice principal to come in so I could have a private conversation with a student in the hallway because they were afraid of me just telling them to sit down was publicly shaming them. So, you know, I had to call numerous times a day for the vice principal to come into my room. I had, I had to go out in the hallway and talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. And an enormous a waste of time in my classroom. How often are you seeing the disruptions? Oh, daily. Daily. And it's not just one kid in a the classroom, there's numerous kids in a classroom that do this. And it's hard for our kids that want to go to school and that want to learn. Lawmakers, are you hearing this from your constituents? Absolutely. I, I think it just breaks my heart to even listen to this, you know, to hear this. But, you know, it's astonishing to think about, but realizing that it's not just a rarity, this is like becoming a, a common story, a common theme. I've heard all of the stories that you have told tonight at least once. I have my daughter-in-law who's a principal in an elementary school who had to chase not once, not twice, but at least three times. One student that would run out of the classroom and would run into the road and she would have to chase him into the road and try to herd him back off onto the sidewalk so they could both be safe and out of traffic. What is a classroom clear and why do you have to do it? A classroom clear is when you have to make the choice. Is it safer for me to remove all the other students than the one student that is deregulated? because that student might not leave or that student will be exhibiting unsafe behavior. So it is a my professional decision at that moment based 100% on the safety of my students. It is incredibly terrifying. You don't get to send a note home to all the parents telling them that their kids were traumatized that day based on the behavior. You don't get to send a note home saying, I'm sorry we didn't do math today because of this. As a teacher, I have no time to collect myself, to breathe, to be human in that experience. I get to just have a brave face for the rest of my students. I don't always have a chance to have res restoration after because of staffing issues, because of time constraints. 
Number three, my purpose had expired. I saw a statistic the other day that says out of the entire teaching population of the United States of America, black men make up less than 1%. Lower income schools or schools that have a big minority populations, it's important for them to put the face of black people in the forefront so that the community can see that they are representative of the community in their education goals. But the truth is, is they're really not. Largely, all schools are still dominated by white females as the teachers. The administration is still dominated by white men. But what I started to see, if you're the only black male teacher in the school, there's no support for anything that you have to go through racially or, any, or socially, anything like that. And what I noticed is that the black students are used to being coddled by these white female teachers. There is a very, very strong current of white guilt that circumvents a lot of different industries, but teaching especially, where white female teachers make up 85% of the teaching population in the United States. These female teachers have a very kind of mothering, nurturing aspect to them. And what they do with these black students is they're kind of objectified into these poor, poor, underserved minority kids. Black students aren't stupid at all. They pick up on that 100% and they can play up the guilt card and they can pay, play up the feel sorry for you card so that they have an easier time getting away with all of the stuff that they might want to get away with. And again, they're kids. And my governor has put into place some ridiculous legislation that many governors across the country have put into place, such as I can't teach anything divisive, I can't teach critical race theory, and I can't teach about racial equity. This is at all public schools, colleges, and universities. So, teachers, <clears throat> in the past, we've been activists. After this shit show of last year, we really need to stand up and do what's right for our kids right now. So, this is a call to action, teachers. We gotta stand up and fight for our kids because this is bullshit. We can't lie to them. Largely, all schools are still dominated by white females as the teachers, 85% of the teaching population in the United States. Oh, I'm just yeah. <laughs> I've been at my school, this is my fifth year there, and I've seen change just at my school for the past five years, and it's not been for the better, and it's not a lack of our administrators trying very hard. We have Trillium Services at our school, and we are able to get students to go see a counselor if we can get them through all the paperwork. And that is huge to have to have that partnership. We have a lot of partnerships with some of the community members, but it's not enough. And when you have four kids, six kids that are all losing it at the same time, you're sort of kind of trying to cage them from everybody else. I actually had a colleague that said, that said it really well. She said, the kid leaves, the, the student maybe that is deregulated leaves, and then, they come back maybe 10, 15 minutes later, they're fine. The rest of us aren't. Something happened and we didn't do anything about it. And maybe we then have a restorative circle, maybe we do that kind of a thing, but at what point are we not teaching our standards? I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a psychotherapist, that's not my training. And at what point do you want me to teach and at what point do you want me to be a therapist and like how am I supposed to juggle all those things? Or it becomes normalized, you know, mm -hmm. for my daughter. Yes, I was in the classroom normalized. sitting next to her working on a project and this little boy um, couldn't draw a straight line. And he lost it and he went under the table and he was screaming and yelling and kicking, which caused another little girl to go under the table and do the same. And I'm traumatized sitting there like, what can I do to help? and my daughter just tugs my shirt and says, Mom, it's okay, this is normal. How does that prepare kids, too, for when they see a mental health crisis as they grow older out in society? Like, we're telling them, it's, it's normal, ignore that, keep calm, we'll keep you safe. And these kids are, they're really internalizing that. And then if something does happen out in society, the idea would not be to just stay calm and, and stay right near the person who's having a crisis. The idea would be to get away and get help, but we're not teaching children that, kind of as an, as an overarching education system right now. Nicole, what kinds of classroom disruptions are you seeing in your school? Not those. 
You know, I run a different ship in room 205. I think, you know, for me, I want to start by saying I absolutely love my students, and they're my babies. And the disruptions that I'm seeing are a little different. The disruptions that I'm seeing center around trauma. I've always tried to recognize that some of the traumas that I am seeing are indicative of a larger problem, that is a symptom of something else, and it's, something, it's a way that they're communicating, and it's the only tool that they have in their toolbox. I know that there are plenty of other teachers who work in my building and probably some that work in yours who have seen some different things. For mine, it is, it is extreme poverty. It's homelessness and houselessness. I've had one of my students who is living in a car. One of my students today lives in a shelter. So when I deal with homework or trying to differentiate, many of my mornings are started with slow starts, started with restorative circles, starting with morning check-ins, just trying to figure out where they are so that I can avoid some of what I think my colleagues are dealing with. Being the youngest teacher in the room, I'm trying to learn from my veteran teachers and how I can start these things from the beginning so that it doesn't get to some of the outbursts that I, that I know could, could come that are imminent. But I always want to preface it that I you know, strenuously believe that some of what our children are displaying because it's the only tool in their toolbox. It's not like because they're black, they misbehave. It's because they're kids, they misbehave. Because I feel like I was placed there to handle the black kids, to relate to the black kids. I thought the best way to do that is to not treat them like they are deficient, to not treat them like they're inferior, to treat them that they are smart, they are capable, they are responsible, and they will be held accountable. The percentage of the kids who were like, ugh, I don't like this. I don't like the fact that this teacher is holding me accountable and making me actually work and making me actually be responsible for my actions. And so as a result, they would go back to these white teachers and these white administrators and say, oh, I need help. And they would jump to the help of these students, not because they actually needed help, but because again, they're trying to keep butts in the seats. Treating them like they're capable uh, people got uh, too out of hand and my usefulness and my strategies and kind of my place had just kind of worn out and my purpose has expired. So that was one of the main reasons why I started thinking about quitting and eventually quit a couple of years ago. To sum it all up, I liked teaching. I just didn't like being a teacher. I did enjoy the fact of shaping kids' lives and you know I liked being kind of having a captive audience and, and being a charismatic lecturer and things that I'm good at. I did enjoy that, but the whole arc of being a teacher, especially nowadays, is just too much. People who make a choice to be teachers deserve to have a living wage and deserve to have respect and deserve to have some type of support and job security and what they do because what they do is a difficult task. People have the attitude that if people want to be teachers, you want to do it for free because you just love kids and you just want to be around kids and that's all you want to do. So we can pay you $35,000 a year and have crappy benefits because you would do it for free. So I felt my talents were wasted there. And although there were aspects and there still are aspects that I miss about it, it definitely to me ran its course I feel like I hung in there longer than most teachers did. With 11 years, I think the mark is like five or six years where most teachers quit. So I hung in there for a while, but I'd been to too many school districts. I had worked with too many administrations and kept seeing the same things over and over and over again. Not holding the kids accountable, not supporting, and not understanding the dynamic of having an African-American male teacher on staff and just in general, people not caring. Parents not really caring what's going on at the school. The state not really caring about what's going on at the school. Students really not caring what's going on at the school. Nobody cares. So I always liken it to me being like a clown at a kid's birthday party and the parents paid for this clown to entertain these kids and the kids now want to abuse this clown. They want to punch the clown. They want to hit the clown and kick the clown and put a cream pie in the clown's face. And all the while, the parents are just sitting by looking at the clown like, you had better let them hit you in the face with a pie, damn it. And I hated feeling like that. Failing in school is one thing, but then that failing, if, they, if boys who are dropping out of high school at a much higher rate than girls, and even though they're being admitted to college at a 60-40 rate only, they graduate from college now at about one half the rate of daughters, and he's a well-behaved child at home. So it's confusing when um, we're trying to help the teacher with this behavior. All I can say is the missing ingredient I've seen over 31 years 
is there's not as many consequences for the kids. And people talk about trauma, and I'm sure the kids are. You know, I don't know, I always say, what trauma do they have today in the year 2019 they didn't have 10 years ago? I and mean, we had the same issues that kids have today. What I've seen is when they, the kids mouthed off to me 15 years ago, they were sent home. And the principal said to the kid and the parents, you are not allowed to t talk to my teachers that way. And we were backed up. And nowadays, they can't send them home. So Mike, he believes this is no consequences. What are your thoughts on this, Sarah? I, I gotta say, I'm, I was with you. I've, I've been there and I've, I've felt that, that it needed to be first this, then this, and, and no wavering. And, and that was how I started my administration. And it, it took a lot for me to swallow it and think a little bit differently. But for us, what we were doing with zero tolerance wasn't working. We had to teach them and really intervene on what their deficit was with behavior, just like we do with reading, just like we do with math, and not send them home, even though you want to, and that's what well, we've yeah, always done. Well, yeah, I'm not done. saying to send them home, because I don't agree with that. Okay. But I agree that they have to have a consequence. Absolutely. Because when they get yes. out in the real world, mm -hmm. there called, aren't going to be any that's, excuses. That's called prison. So I have they a, won't I have be a any excuses. hard, um, I'm okay. having a really hard time and with some of the in conversation. School, in the public schools, we reward them when they behave well, and when they what misbehave, we don't give them consequence. Not as many consequences, but they get out in the real world. We don't get rewarded for behaving well. We get punished. No, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying they need to have accountability. Yes, but I agree. agree. For yes. their actions. They have to yes. have yes. accountability. And I think trauma kids yes. need that also. They're yes. crying out for that accountability. Absolutely. They want mm -hmm. someone to come alongside them and say, hey, you've done this, so here is what needs to happen. There, you're, you have to have a little bit of accountability to, in order mm -hmm. to, if, if you're going to behave this way. If we believe that kids do well if they can, yes. then, then we're operating that there's a deficit and that we need to teach them a skill. And that's, and that's where we're going to find the most success. So if there's a consequence, the consequence really needs to be a way to teach them the skill that they're yes. lacking. And so and reinforce that over and over. Right, it and then it's a, a lot easier to support a student if we assume that kids do well if they can versus they're out to get me. This five-year-old is out to attack me. That's, it, it's really hard to support someone if we feel that way about them. Well, yeah, I mean, I've always thought you have to counsel them, but you also have consequences. You can't have one without the other. Um, and the mom is saying, hey, don't be mean, he's, he's upset that you're not doing that. Uh, whereas the dad will say, no, I need to make it clear to him that he can't just manipulate everything, he do everything he wants to do and expect us to take him everywhere and not have the discipline to succeed himself. Not well, without a quid pro quo. Yeah. So what do you mean by exactly by boundary enforcement in that situation and the um, difference between mothers and fathers in that? Yes, um, a mom will be much more likely to say, um, a mom and dad will both set boundaries almost the same way. One of the biggest uh, misunderstandings in parenting is not understanding the difference between setting boundaries versus enforcing boundaries. So moms and dads, when a mom is with a child more than a dad, she tends to set bedtimes that are, uh, that are earlier. Dads mm -hmm. set, set later bedtimes, so you think, oh, the dad is more lenient. But the studies show that the children with dads get to bed, in fact, earlier than the children with moms. Because moms tend to do something like, um, set, they set the bedtime, let's say at 8.30, and the child it comes to 8.30 and, uh, and the child says, oh, I haven't finished my homework. And mom goes, oh my goodness, I definitely don't want you to go into school without finishing your homework. Okay, sweetie, you know, you can spend a little bit more time finishing your homework. And she monitors and sees, and then that becomes nine o'clock. Oh, you didn't read me a story. Okay, I'll mm -hmm. be sorry. Since you did your homework, that was good that you did that. And now it's 9.15, 9.30. Dad is more likely to say some version of, um, you know, the data bears this out. I'm sorry, you didn't do your homework. You had all this time to do it. You're going right. to have go to class and not do your homework well. All right, but, tough luck for you, rat. Go to bed. <laughs> exactly. Do better yeah. next time. Yeah. Do you know, Warren, if there's been any studies linking that capacity for boundary enforcement to personality traits like agreeableness? Has that has the work been done at that fine-grained level? I, do, I don't 
know for sure about the agreeableness per se, but I think one of the misunderstandings about moms and dads is that behavior, that agreeable behavior, is considered by moms as being like unconditional love. Whereas we don't use the word unconditional love nearly as often with our dads, but in fact, our dads have unconditional love, but for them, part of unconditional love is having conditional approval. Yeah, well, that, I think maybe that's the distinction between, it's something like the distinction between that all-encompassing maternal acceptance that's maybe at the core of infant care and the encouragement that's more patriarchal or patristic. Okay, let's hear from Nicole. So I think the, the component that's missing for me in these discussions, and Mike and I, we, we used to work in the same campus, so we would go round and round about these particular issues. Um, so I'm gonna stand flat-footed and say it's also consequences and it's also accountability, but one of the things that I'm not hearing is care. And what I appreciated that Adrian said was that, that we have to assume that my students show up every single morning. No one gets up in the morning and says, how can I screw up Ms. Watson's day today? The language gets dangerous to me when we start talking about consequences and we start talking about the way we did it in the old, it ain't working that way. And I can consequence and I can send referrals and I can write a million of them. And if that's working, then let me know where. But it isn't. The one ingredient that has worked for me has been care. That when I walk in there with compassion, that I needed someone to have for me, all of a sudden I see them different. I don't see them like these people I've got to kick out. I see them as these, these developing humans. I've got to teach how to care, how to deal with the trigger and move forward. Coming up on Classrooms in Crisis Solutions. I want to hear your theories on why this is happening. I don't think any kid should be on any sort of social media or any sort of device unless they're on a Kindle and they're reading a damn book. And later. So what did you take off their plate in order for them to be able to do this? We lowered our expectations until we had this in place mm. because truly they weren't teaching anyway. You have to hit kids if you're on a budget. <laughs> What do they tell you to do? Oh, take something away from the child. I'm in a trailer park. I don't have shit. <laughs> What's my mom supposed to do? Like, y'all keep acting up. We're not going to go to the, um... I'll just come here. I'm going to punch you in the face. Ring. I'm not going to do shit. <laughs> and those things, are, those things are juxtaposed to some degree because the universal love is, well, you're okay exactly the way you are and we accept you, but the conditional love is, no, you have to grow up. When, and because we love you, we don't want you to stay infantile. We want you to develop competence. We want you to be not only socially acceptable, but socially sophisticated, productive, generous. And that's all conditional on, well, a very high level of behavior. Absolutely. And we see this also exactly right. And we see this even in the way family dinner nights are constructed. And we, you know, we all know that family dinner nights are highly correlated with a healthy family and healthy, healthy children. But many family nights deteriorate into family dinner nightmares by the mother and father sort of uh, interrupting the child when she, she or he is talking or arguing a different, you know, a different perspective on something. I think that we're kind of breeding a narcissistic culture and instead of schools and society and parents going against the grain of that, they're really facilitating, feeding and empowering those mindsets. People just want what's good for them or what they like without any any respect of wondering what's good for everyone. And I ultimately just couldn't see any kind of way around it. And I got tired of it. And that's not at all even to mention just the mountains of paperwork, the zillions of meetings, some of the crazy observation practices. This is just talking kind of about dealing with students and their families in relation to school rules and procedures. I also got really worn out by the horrible attitude that my students had constantly, no matter how fun that I tried to make things, no matter how much I tried to meet them where they were, I just constantly never really felt like they were meeting me where I was. I felt like I was kind of giving my best, which is 80% on any given day, but I felt like they were barely giving me 20%. So I felt like I was trying to do my job and their job. And I gotta say, even their parents' job. The more I noticed over the years, our professional development started changing where we were supposed to be teaching kids more and more things that normally a parent would teach, like basic life skills, basic emotional management, basic conflict resolution, the kind of things that by sixth grade a kid should be coming to school with, they weren't. And so we 
were expected to essentially almost behave as if we were each kid's counselor. And it was just impossible when you have over 100 students. As much as we want to do those kind of things is absolutely wearing so many of us out. I've seen teachers under tables crying, no joke, the last couple of years because the standards that were put on teachers just keep getting higher and the standards that the students were expected to do just kept getting lower and yet everybody was not sure why test scores weren't what they were hoping that they would be. Without understanding that being only empathetic toward a child does not produce an empathetic child. It produces often a self-centered child right, right, um, right. That, is, that is filled with himself. Um, and so part of, a, you know, what part of what I discovered was so important in family dinner nights is to make sure that the children also um, are required, not encouraged, but required to also listen to the parents' perspective without interrupting them and to, mm -hmm. and, and to empathize with it. Talking on a turn, that's a peddling. Looking out the window, that's a peddling. Staring at my sandals, that's a peddling. Paddling the school canoe, oh, you better believe that's a peddling. Mm. Again, this is, this is terrible, man. This is terrible. But the thing that really gets me, though, that really blows my mind is that everybody knows <laughs> how uneducated and dumb some of these young people are in this country. It's a shame that this guy was even able to graduate high school. He should never even graduate high school. Assuming that he's not in high school. He, he looks like he might be 19, 20. But they want to get rid of like AP classes or, you know, advanced placement uh, classes and stuff like that. They want to get rid of advanced classes and take the smart students who actually do know this stuff and say, hey, you know what? Because it's racist for you guys to be in, in these advanced classes. We're going to place you in classes with guys like this, right? Guys that need remedial help, right? This guy obviously would need more help in school, okay? I don't think he was making A's and B's, okay? I think he was probably making C's and D's, right? Uh, if he's lucky, okay? So they want to dumb it down for everybody. They even want to make the smart kids dumb. I don't. Dig deep. Civil War. I really don't know. Hey y'all, who fought in the Civil War? Who fought in the Civil War? Yeah. I forgot, honestly. Take it. These are kids. These are young school age kids. They they can't tell you who fought in the Civil War. Again, this is why there's no surprise that our schools are failing. This is why it's no surprise that our kids are more concerned about social activism because they don't know anything else. They don't know anything else. And this is exactly what they want stupid, dumbed down kids. They don't know anything. They can't even tell you who fought in the Civil War. Good guess. Who against who? It was the US and the Japanese. No way you got that right. You just guessed? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know who the 69th president of the United States is? The what? The 69th president. I don't. It's a trick question. Uh... If you had to guess, so the 69th, who was he? Obama. Yes. Spell Mississippi. Mississippi? Mississippi. You know, just Giuseppe, so I'm gonna base it off that. Giuseppe, G-U-I-S-S. P-E-I. So Mississippi will be spelled M-I-S-S. -S. Bro, Mississippi, bro. Mississippi. Oh, Mississippi. Sis. M-I. Oh, and by the way, children, there's a walkout scheduled today to protest the war. So uh, if you're against the war, run along outside. And if you're for the war, uh, stay here and we'll do math problems. Excuse me, boys. Tom Stoutzel, HBC News. Can you tell me why you kids marched out of school today? Uh, war? Boys, what do you think the Founding Fathers would say? The faggy who? Yeah! Little commies are pretty pleased with yourselves going out there and protesting America and then saying on national television that you don't even know who the Founding Fathers are. You kids don't know squat about America, do you? Well, not really, no. Well, that's just jingles. What's the biggest number that you can think of? A uh, hundred. I don't know. How many 
people are in this mall? A <laughs> hundred. A lot. A hundred is really the biggest number you can think of. What number comes after 100? 101. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I guess some of those people probably didn't have answers in the spot because they were probably nervous because somebody asked you a question like that and you got to think about it. But those are basic questions that every American should have answers to. They should know those things. Again, these are people who are voting. They don't know any of that stuff. But again, I guarantee if you ask those people things about their favorite celebrity or, you know, favorite rapper, favorite athlete, they know all that stuff. Again, this is a shame, man. It's bad. And it's, again, it's more and more terrible once when you read every single day about the fact that they fought so hard, right, tooth and nail, to have teachers be able to talk to kids about gender and sex. And I'm like, like, we have no time in the day, considering how stupid a lot of these kids are, for teachers to be discussing anything about gender and sex with kids in school, right? We just don't have time. These kids don't know anything. Right, our education system is failing. Again, it's a shame, man. It, it really is. I, I feel bad, man. This video right here is a prime example about how our public education system has failed. You just sent me something which is about the Princeton, New Jersey public school system yeah. dumbing down math in the name of equity. And you ruined my morning. It's <laughs> business of equity. You know, what is it? Equity of outcomes means that you, you dumb it down and that that's supposed to be a gift to people of our complexion. I'm sick of this. What do you, what do you think of that? Well, let me, let's uh, share with the audience what you're talking about. I have a message here from someone who follows the Glenn Show who is simply reporting about a controversy in the Princeton public school system. And he is sharing a public announcement from a committee of concerned parents in Princeton University about diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative at the school system in Princeton, the public school system. We write to express our serious concern about the direction the Princeton public school system is taking under the current administration and the new superintendent, Dr. Carol Kelly. We first became aware of this new direction when the district formed a math committee this spring to consider changes to the math curriculum. The committee was charged with considering changes proposed by an outside consultant hired by the district, a Dr. Eric Milou, who is a well-known advocate of de-tracking or eliminating accelerated course options. The proposed reforms include de-tracking the math curriculum through 10th grade so that all students, regardless of their aptitude or interest in math, would be taught the same content. Algebra 1 would no longer be taught to 7th and 8th grade students. Instead, all students would take Algebra 1 in 9th grade. The Princeton High School math curriculum would end with pre-calculus. The existing calculus courses would no longer be taught. It is disadvantaged students who stand to lose the most from this leveling down approach. Families of means can and will seek such instruction elsewhere if it is not provided by the public schools. This public letter goes on. Even more disturbing, in response to a parent outcry opposing these charges, district administrators engaged in what can only be called a cover-up by denying that the math committee was formed to consider Dr. Milou's recommendations, by denying that Dr. Milou even made recommendations, and by releasing only a heavily redacted version of Dr. Milou's report that conceals his recommendations, made available only after parents made a formal request citing Open Public Records Act. Anyone truly interested in educational equity and social justice has to deal with a serious problem. By age three, children from economically advantaged families will have had about 45 million words spoken to them in their first three years of life, whereas children from low-income families will have had only about 13 million words spoken to them. Professors of psychology and human development Betty Hart and Todd Risley whose research led to this finding, called this gap of 30 million words by age three the early catastrophe. It's a catastrophe that keeps growing if schools don't supply a remedy, because those 30 million extra words begin to form a kind of net, not just of words, but of meaning and knowledge about the world. And the more knowledge you have, the more strands you have in your net, the tighter the mesh, the more knowledge you can catch, the more connections you can make to all the new things coming at you. The knowledge rich, in other words, get knowledge richer. 
if public schools aren't closing that knowledge deficit by means of an organized, content-based curriculum that gives low-income students what other kids pick up in their home environments, then all their talk about educational equity is just that. It's talk. Okay. Now everyone take out your safety pencil and a circle of paper. This week, I hope we can finish our work on the letter A. Let me get this straight. We're behind the rest of our class, and we're going to catch up to them by going slower than they are? Cuckoo! 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 Stop it! Stop it! Warren! Melvin! Gary! Dot! Gordy! Look, lady, I'm supposed to be in the fourth grade. Sounds to me like someone's got a case of the spostas. Hmm. Warren! I started to create these bonds with some of the students, even the students that was bad as hell. Like, I started to... I started to kind of like appreciate them a little more. Once I like really got close to them and started to understand their stories and stuff, I started to appreciate them more. The more and more I started to appreciate them and their experiences, the more and more it was difficult for me to work in a school because I realized the school was so jacked up. The structure and the entire like Chicago public school system was crap and it was trash. And I remember visiting uh, Francis Parker. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the school. Francis Parker is a really nice school, kind of north of downtown, very nice, like prestigious school for elementary and high school students. And I remember taking a tour through the school and I'm like, this is low key a college. This is, this is like college. It's better than some junior colleges. I remember visiting that school and getting back to work and just being so pissed off, right? Like I was so mad because I'm like, why are those kids getting that type of quality education? And these students, like, I found that the more and more I started to create these like really strong bonds with some of the students, whether they were like some of the top tier students or some of the students who struggled both with like the discipline and with their grades, I really started to have an appreciation for their stories, where they came from. And I started to get even more infuriated with the system that was failing them. And I didn't want to be a part of it. And I just remember reading statistics and it was like one out of every four black Chicago public school students are at a failing school. And I realized at that moment that I cannot change this system. This is a for real system that's been set in place and it has not been changed for whatever reason. And I can't just go into one school system and change that. We come here every day, the kids hate the school. The staff, they hate the school. Like we passing each other in the hallway with like orange juice and coffee, like man, if we could just make it to Friday, like if we could make it to like winter break, if we could make it to spring. And I just hate it. I hate it working like, I hate it living like that. Like I hate it coming into a community where everybody that's there do not want to be there. The kids don't want to be there. The, the teachers, the staff don't want to be there. The parents don't want to come to report card pickup. Like no one likes it there. So I left and I like didn't have a job lined up or anything. But the one thing I knew for sure that I was going to like be able to leave and get immediately was my happiness. Their teachers and principals manage this feat, however, not because of their ed school training, but often in spite of it. In 2007, education writer Karen Chenoweth profiled 16 such unexpected schools in her book, It's Being Done. Though the schools vary in size, quality of facilities, and geographical location, one thing the teachers and principals in these schools share is the recognition that new teachers will have to be trained more or less from scratch. As Chenoweth writes, they know that new teachers often don't know the first thing about classroom management, standards, curriculum, assessment, reading instruction, or even how to physically set up a classroom. To non-educators, this might seem remarkable because most teachers enter the profession with a degree in education. But teachers and principals in the It's Being Done schools widely agree that, for the most part, university education programs do not even begin to prepare teachers for teaching. Another thing the successful schools share is a commitment to an organized, content-rich curriculum. And that's something central to New York City's highest achieving charter schools as well. The educator Jeffrey Litt has been focusing on carefully structured curricular content for nearly 30 years, beginning in 1992 with Mohegan Elementary in the Bronx, which is a traditional public school that as principal, he transformed. In 2001, he was made the founding principal of the Icon Schools, whose seven public charter schools in the South Bronx he superintends. Mr. Litt's rejection of the anti-curriculum ed school orthodoxy 
has made it possible for him to not only narrow, but often close the achievement gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students. Parents in the South Bronx, which is the poorest area in New York City, have been voting with their feet for two decades. There's always a waiting list of thousands of students, more than 90% of whom are black and Hispanic, trying to get out of New York's traditional public schools and into the icon chartered public schools. So have ed school deans and faculty been flocking to these successful schools to see how they've accomplished what ed schools talk so much about? I probably don't need to answer that question. What about principals and superintendents? Well, one of the most economically and racially diverse schools in the nation, the Lyles Crouch School in Northern Virginia, adopted a carefully sequenced content-rich curriculum starting in 2004 and has been racking up awards left and right since 2007. The principal of that school, Dr. Patricia Zizios, who broke with her ed school training in order to implement this curriculum, reports that despite the awards and despite having outperformed the 12 other elementary schools in her district for three years running, no other school has followed her lead or even taken her up on an offer to help them. But if you think ed schools are bad when it comes to curricula, wait till you hear what they've been doing with reading instruction. Good evening, my name is Lee Allen and I'm the 2022 Gwinnett County Teacher of the Year. I'm here tonight to speak about teacher retention. At the end of this school year, I will be leaving Gwinnett County Schools, leaving behind the opportunity to submit for State Teacher of the Year, roughly $10,000 in salary, and most importantly, the students and colleagues that I've built strong relationships with. I'm leaving in hopes that I can regain the ability to do the job that I love. I'm speaking tonight to raise awareness on issues facing teachers today so the district can seriously consider a plan, a plan to proactively combat these issues before more learning is lost and more teachers leave. I do not claim to speak for all teachers. However, I have spoken with several teachers across the district and state and have solicited and received feedback online from others. The first issue at hand is student apathy and disrespect for school rules and norms. Returning from concurrent learning, we have an alarming number of students that simply do not care about learning and refuse to even try. We are also experiencing incredible disrespect and a refusal to follow basic school rules. There is little to no accountability or expectation for grades or behavior placed on students or parents. Rather than being asked what the student can do to improve their understanding, teachers are expected to somehow do more with less student effort. Next, cell phone use. Teachers cannot possibly compete with the billions of dollars tech companies pour into addicting people to their devices. Phones allow constant communication, often being the spark that fuels fights, drug use, and other inappropriate meetups throughout the day. We need a comprehensive district plan with support behind it in order to combat this epidemic and protect the learning environment. Lastly, there is a huge disconnect between administrators and teachers. The classroom in 2022 is drastically different from just three years ago. Most administrators have not been in a classroom full time in years or even decades. Many teachers currently do not feel understood, valued, or trusted as professionals from administrators and the decisions that they make. Many decisions seem to be short-term band-aids placed on gaping wounds. While these issues are not new and there was a negative trend in these in education before 2020, the pandemic has acted as a catalyst and turned a slow negative trend into an exponential crisis. I won't list complaints without offering ideas for improvement. First, all administrators from the school level and throughout the ISC should be required to spend one week immersed in a high needs classroom without a suit, without people knowing your title, and in the same room all day for an entire week. If administrators truly care about improving the issues, then they need to understand what is happening. You cannot understand the issues in planned visits or 15 minute observations. Next, smaller class sizes need to be a priority. 36 plus students in an academic class makes it near impossible to manage post-COVID behavior while effectively meeting the much higher post-COVID needs of every student. 25 students in a sheltered ESOL class is not what's best for Gwinnett's student body. Every single decision that we make should be for the students. Picture this, a circular model of teachers, parents, and administrators working together with students at the center. Currently, the circle is broken. We must offer support without threats or frivolous lawsuits. We all want the same thing, and we cannot accomplish this without supporting one another. Students need clear and consistent expectations. Lastly, there needs to be transparency. In January of this year, GCPS reported that behavior roles were at the same level, yet many teachers and people are raising red flags about what is happening. If you got people like that and that's the way they are at home and they don't respect any authority, they don't respect the police, they don't respect the government, they don't respect whatever, and they're sending their kid to your school, then that kid does not respect your authority. And the parents are the same way, you know, they'll talk to teachers, I've been on the phone. Teachers hate to call parents. As an administrator, I was constantly, I had to call them every day. They really liked the fact, some of them, that they could just say anything they wanted to and you really couldn't say anything back because you're, you know, you work for the state 
you know, I'm a public employee. So you cuss me out, all I can do is say, you know, don't cuss me out. Uh, I'm going to hang up if you use any more profanity toward me, you know. And you just have to, you know, it's one of those things. You couldn't let it bother you. If that, if that bothered you and it hurt your feelings and all that kind of, you couldn't be an administrator. So, you know, the disrespect from the parents and the disrespect from the community is, to me, higher than it has ever been. You can look at surveys. Uh, a lot of people don't feel, you know, they don't respect teachers. And as administrators, I think they, they have dealt with a lot of uh, disrespect from district level, local school level, federal level administrators that want to dictate every little thing and micromanage every little thing they do in a classroom. Why I quit teaching in public schools after three years. There is a statistic that the majority, vast majority of teachers, I think it's over 50% of teachers quit within the first five years. And I think it's like 50% of special education public school teachers quit within two or three years. And I am, I was a special education teacher, so I am another one of those statistics. And I think it's important to talk about why this is happening and why teachers are quitting at such an alarming rate and why teachers are going on strike in so many different states. This is not just like a one state or a one city problem. This is a nationwide, I would say, crisis, like no joke, straight up crisis. And I think it really needs to be addressed. And unfortunately, I've seen politicians say that they're gonna do something and then the left is is actually kind of leading this movement, but the way they're, the way at least California was striking and criticizing was like, that probably angers people on the right and like teachers have a good cause and I would consider myself, like I actually don't really buy into politics, but I would consider myself more like conservative. And if the left is just gonna bash conservatives, I'm like, I'm here too, I agree with you, I, you know? So I think that it's a bipartisan issue for sure. And we're gonna have to come together as a nation to really address this. And it's not just the schools, like it goes beyond the schools. It's actually a crisis of society. It's like a nationwide societal, moral, spiritual crisis that we're in. And it's manifesting itself in public education and government workers are bearing the brunt of this issue with what I think it was my first year there and we had a student that was very worried about fire drills and when he came back in and he was freaking out our principal would not take him being rude and was like you do not talk to me that way and then it was funny because like she's not sure if yeah, that was yeah, the right thing to do because that's what she would have done with any other student right and she looked at us and she was like was that the right thing? And we were like, yeah. Yes. Um, but that's what we need. We need the support. But in a lot of these stories, when situations escalated, who doesn't help? Admin. Who closes their door? Admin. And when you reach out, they say, oh, I'll see what I can do. And they don't. And I think that's just like feeding the fire for like a really toxic environment because all you really want is a supportive admin. I'm just wondering, like, what what are admins being taught in, like, admin school? Act, like, what, to, are, what are principals being taught in principal school? I don't know. I don't know. Because... To close doors. It, what was the story that I read? One of the teachers had, like, a screaming child on the floor, happened to be by the main office or by the principal's office, and their door was open at the time, and the door just slowly closed on her. There was no... Hey, you need help? Hey, can I get something for you? How dare you? You close the door on somebody dealing with a meltdown and you don't get in on there in there to help. Here's what I took and that's why I'm getting I'm getting louder because I feel like I was just reading all these stories with admin and I feel like what I heard was admin did not want to take the accountability and therefore if anything were to happen that accountability for whatever happened in that situation would not be shared. It would be only on the teacher. And and that's what I kept hearing when I read these stories about admin just turning around mid hallway, they don't walking the other it. way. 
And it's not just that they don't want to deal with it. It's they don't want their name on it. They don't want to have to tell the parent what they saw, what they did, what they said. The accountability is all on the teachers and that's incredibly stressful. So that just reminded sad. me of another story. When I was an administrator and I observed teachers, you know, as time went on, the, the observations became more and more complex. It took more and more paperwork, more and more data, more and more proof that you were teaching and they were learning. Uh, like I couldn't just go in there and look at it and say, it looks to me like they're learning. I mean, I had to have evidence and all that. So anyway, me as an administrator, when I, because I taught 17 years, when I would go in a classroom, I could size up pretty quick what was going on. And if I could tell from the data that you have, and I could tell from what was happening, and I could tell from what the kids were doing, that kids were learning in that classroom, I wasn't going to mess with you. I wasn't going to sit here and give you a bad score because you didn't have the standard written on the left side of the board up here on the thing, you know, or, or you didn't have the day's date on the right hand side with this, so you didn't have uh, your lesson plans in a green notebook on the right hand side of your desk over next to the window, and you didn't have, uh, you know, the word of the day posted on the back board. You know, I'm not going to get, if they're teaching and kids are learning, I'm not messing with them. I, I'm just not. There's plenty of other teachers that are trying to teach that need to be micromanaged, that need you to be in their room and need you to tell them what to do, than to mess with the ones that are doing a good job. No wonder they get frustrated. They're doing a good job, kids are learning, they get good test scores, and then you're still in there fussing at them about, you know, what they wrote on the board or what color their chalk is or what, I mean, you know, if they're teaching, let them teach. We don't want a bunch of teaching machines all doing things exactly the same way. If they're good at lecturing, let them lecture. You know, don't say, well, all you do is sit up there and talk. Yeah, but the kids love it. They're all taking notes and they all make good grades on my tests and they get good grades on the screen. Let them lecture if they're good at it. You know, now if they're doing something wrong, stop them. You know, if, if the kids are, are failing, inter, you know, interject, take care, you know, get, get you know, get, help them out. But if they're being successful, it's like a baseball, if you take a baseball player that's hitting 400, I'm not going to go in there and, you know, as a manager go, hey, uh, you know what, I don't like the way you hold your bat. I want you to change the way you hold your bat. I'm hitting 400, coach. I don't care. On our team, we hold the bat this way. Why would I mess with him? He's hitting 400. Let him hit. So have the respect for the profession enough to, if they show evidence that they can do their job, let them do their job. Leave them alone let them do their job and I'm telling you it's the same thing the the federal government don't think the states can can do what they need to do for education and the states don't think the counties can do what they need to do for education and it, you know it's everybody is dictating all the way down and it impacts the classroom you know and it's all because we don't think the teachers can make their own tests we don't think the teachers can decide what to teach we don't think the teachers can do stuff on their own. We don't think the teachers can come up with rules on their own. You know, we don't think teachers can do classroom management. They can do all of that. But anyway, a lot of a lot of the lack of respect has come from administration, you know, and, and district level administration. A teacher that had to take her student because she had like peed on herself and she had to take her to the bathroom but she was like wailing and crying and so upset about it and she's like trying to get this poor girl to the bathroom as she's trailing pee and then the admin goes excuse me i think you need to call the parent while she's in the middle of the meltdown and she's like are you kidding me right now why don't you call the parents since you're not doing anything is what she thought but didn't say D yeah um <laughs> i'm like come on like yeah. you see there's a crisis going on and you're telling yeah. her more things to do that's exactly actually what that's exactly what brie actually said in her story too is that was one of the responses is can you call the mom and she's like sir ma'am you want where what with what time i have 30 kids back here 10 of which are ripping each other's heads off and you want me to just call a mom that's what you want me to do brie actually did share with one specific student that that exact thing happened where an administrator was seen down the hall the student saw the administrator was immediately changing their demeanor and then the admin saw the exchange and what was going on and walked down the stairs just completely ignored it and then the student realized oh, they're not coming for me so i can still continue on behaving how I'm, I'm behaving and that's the problem these kids literally feel like they can get away with anything because they literally can they actually can 
it's and what did you say what did you say that Bree had said if there's one thing that you take from this it's that teachers are afraid of their administrators and administrators are afraid of parents parents are afraid of their children and these children are afraid of no one so and when we talk about being afraid there is something to be said about boundaries and and discipline and when we talk about discipline people are quick to talk about corporal punishment whatever absolutely not there is a healthy boundary that needs to be set and it starts at home you know teachers can't be expected to come to school and teach children what a boundary is and what you should and should not do and how you should respect adults but you're not even teaching them basic decency as a human i mean these stories there is there's no care for humans at all from children that is a learned behavior 100 percent. where do they learn that from and to go back a little bit i'm going to share when you talk about the toxicity of the culture in schools my one of my very first experiences with an administrator i had a student she was extremely behavioral and extremely impulsive and after my session she took my drink and i just dumped it all over my keyboard my keyboard wasn't working. So I then had to go ask for another keyboard and explain why. And they asked me why. And I said, you know, I had a student who became very upset. They took a drink off the table and dumped it and they stopped me mid sentence. I will never forget the feeling of unworthiness and guilt that started before I was even in the profession. And they were like, you never blame a child for anything. And if anything happens, it will always be your fault. Exact words. It's funny. I do the complete opposite in class. I was like, don't look at me mad. You can only blame yourself. (laughs) Well, now I know that, right? But could you imagine like barely being in the profession? I was in profession for like an hour. And that was what she said to me was that if, if anything breaks or if anything happens, it is your fault. And it is is never the child's fault. And I think that's a problem. Mm-hmm. I think that's a huge problem because unpopular opinion, and I'll say it again, is just because you have an IEP does not excuse you from bad behavior, from being unkind, from being disrespectful, from crossing people's boundaries. That does not excuse you from that at all. So that was my very first experience. Do you have one that sticks out with you on when? when that teacher guilt hit you for the first time? Everything, there's so many stories. And if you are a teacher out there, you know, there's so many stories and you are kind of sick at this point of being the one to complain and say the crazy stuff that happened at school when all your friends are living these normal lives. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah. Okay, so anyway. Uh, Lack of respect from the national media has just been horrible. I mean, you, know, you get story after story after story about how the U.S. education system is failing and da 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 and teachers in other countries do this and teachers in other countries do that. These other countries where these teachers are doing all these fantastic things are not really doing anything different than the way we used to teach 20, 30 years ago. It's just that their society is entirely different. Nobody looks at it and says, hey, in America, we have a problem with society. Our kids can't learn because the teacher can't walk in the classroom and say, everybody be quiet, sit down, and start teaching. That's why we're having issues, because the teacher has to have a 45-minute conference because she told Johnny to sit down over here, and Johnny wanted to sit over there. Even in my behavior room, no one behaved like that. They were in a room, they were in a safe space where they could be with one-on-one guidance and support. Like, I would have never known these kids were bad in class. And I go show up to this school, they have none of that. They don't have any of that. And unfortunately, most schools around the country don't have any of that kind of thing. Like these kids with such severe problems that if you tell them to put something away, they throw things and start flipping desks and screaming. That's not a school issue. That's not like any other issue other than a parenting issue. And I hate to say it, like that's a parenting issue. If you have a kid where you don't say no to it or you ignore it, or you're working too hard, or you hate to say it, but you and your spouse aren't getting along, or if you're divorced, or if you're a single parent and you are super nice to the kid because your divorced spouse or baby daddy or whoever is not in the picture, or they, you just, you're basically, these parents are in competition 
and it's not a bad thing like I understand like everyone's got stuff like we all have issues that we're going through like everyone does it's a part of life but raising a kid I didn't know this and most people when they're first-time parents probably don't know this like I had to learn it as a teacher kids need love and they need attention crave it like they want that they're born that way they're born to crave their mother and their father's attention and they need love to grow and if you don't get that you're you're gonna end up acting up so this kid who one who's flipping tables his mom was an alcoholic and meth user and she did drugs all day was incapable of taking care of her two kids and she had mental illnesses the dad was a normal guy he raised both he had a brother both boys he was actually a teacher at school. He got a much younger girlfriend who was like 19 years old and then I guess the wife and him were just having issues. For some reason he ended up shooting himself and and the, the two boys were devastated. They only had, a, the, this was when this kid was in like third grade, he only had a mom who was on drugs and incapable of taking care of him to go to. So after three years of going back and living with mom, this kid shows up in my classroom after two weeks of not even going to school and mom doesn't even care to take him to school. That's, what did I, like honestly, what did I expect? I mean, that was a pretty mild response considering everything. So yeah, th this is going on all over the country. These kids are growing up in the worst conditions ever, like the worst conditions. These kids, they depend on school for breakfast and lunch. Like they actually need, if they need to go to school, otherwise they're not gonna eat that day. I had half of the students in my classroom, both years that I taught, and I'll go into my, my second year teaching in a second. Both, both years, about half the school would get a big pack of food I mean, I'm from California, I'm a hippie, basic organic, part-time vegan, so it's like chips and like donuts and like perish non-perishables and items like that, nothing fresh, no fruits, no vegetables, nothing. Tackies, Doritos, that's what they're given on Friday by the crisis counselor because so many schools have to have crisis counselors. <laughs> These kids are in crisis, like no joke, some of them are homeless, like it's crazy. And it's at every school, it's at every school now. Every single public school, I guarantee you, has one kid that's homeless, has one kid whose parents are addicted to drugs, has one kid who was sexually molested by a relative the night before they're in your classroom. And I'm not, it's not one. Like, the sad thing is, it's like, it's way more than one. It's a ton of them. Like, all of them are going through this crap because our society, don't get me started on that, but. We have a societal issue. They don't want to have an answer to any authority. They don't want to do what anybody tells them to do. Uh, they want everything customized, especially for them. It's a total consumer thing. It's easy to blame the teacher. We're not. We're not making good scores. Well, who? who, who where'd they learn math from? Teachers. Let's blame the teachers. You know, we don't have good scores in. in uh, well, who, who taught them? Teachers. Teachers. It's the teacher's fault. Kids can't act right. Whose fault is it? Well, who's in the classroom with them? The teacher. Okay, it's the teacher's fault. The kids can't act right because they're the one in the classroom with them. It's not all the teacher's fault. You know, it's the family's fault. It's the, you know, it may be part of the teacher's fault. It may be, you know, it's maybe everybody's fault, but it's a societal thing. But anyway, you guys that are teaching, thank y'all. Thank y'all for staying in it and seeing a bigger picture of the education system's more important than whether the kid cussed me out today. The United States still needs to be teaching math and, <laughs> you know, and I can't just quit because, you know, one kid said, called me the B word, you know, I got to keep, you know, I got to keep going. You know, and, and you people that, that are in the trenches and they're every day doing that, I appreciate, you know, that. I'm glad that I did it. I'm glad I stayed with it the whole time. You know, it makes an impact. It's, it's, it's for, you know, it's for society. You know, it's not just for that kid. It's not just about that one kid that it's driving you crazy or whatever. So uh, thank y'all for the job that y'all do. Teachers are also leaving because of the lack of respect that's being shown towards the profession as a whole. And truthfully, this one makes no sense to me. Some people forget that a strong education is a firm foundation for a better quality of life for you and those all around you. Not giving the kids a quality education and then complaining when your community starts to go downhill is like saying, I'm never going to change my car's oil and then, oh, why did the engine crack? I don't know. Then there's the parents. The parents are the teachers, both the greatest ally and greatest hindrance. Your child is not the only kid we teach and education is a shared responsibility. Constantly blaming teachers for a child's lack of effort is dangerous. Then admin siding with the parent and the schools passing them anyways is even more dangerous. 
Actions have consequences, and demanding that a school change the rules or bend them just for you and your child is both dangerous and creates another generation of entitlement. And frankly, we don't need any more seasons of Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. So this thing called Common Core, I really don't know much about it. Despite my log background, I was not interested in really learning too much about it. But basically, IDEA was passed, and then uh, No Child Left Behind was passed, and then Common Core was passed. So basically, all these public schools, they can't fail kids. So they they end up they end up getting passed to the next grade without doing any work and just showing up being a complete little like twat all day long and knowing that they're not gonna they're gonna pass and it's fine and they all know this all the kids know this they share this mentality and then you also have them being raised by parents who a lot of, a lot of the time don't care their parent these parents are like between 25 and like 40 years old right now who are raising kids so they're like kind of millennials kind of not. They're so having kids like young, a lot of the people are, were in middle school, high school, I mean, that's another thing. You don't know how many kids are, are pregnant in high school. Like there are so many girls pregnant, like the first school, the first school, remember that first school, that great school, that high school that those kids go to, I had a friend who worked there. She said 20 girls were pregnant in the high school, 20, and that's very low. Other schools have way more kids that are getting pregnant because they watch 16 and Pregnant and then they watch uh, Teen Mom and they want to be like that. These kids are getting raised by absentee parents. They're being raised by YouTube, raised by MTV, raised by VH1, raised by Snapchat, raised by Instagram. And growing up and it's like, whoa, what do we, what do we have here? Because it really does take a village to raise a child. You can't teach a child manners. They're not going to behave. They're not going to have manners. They're not going to be nice. They're not going to say, I'm sorry. They're not going to say, excuse me. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to be a decent human being if you don't teach that to them. I want to hear your theories on why this is happening. Why has this become a crisis? The brain research that goes in yes. on technology and a uh, young child. Please. Fortnite. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I mean, I just breaks my heart. I go to a restaurant with my family and I see an infant who can barely hold anything, but they got a phone in their hand mm -hmm. and they're this close to all this information. It's too much, too soon, it's unnecessary. I don't think any kid should be on any sort of social media or any sort of device unless they're on a Kindle and they're reading a damn book. To mention the influence of social media on students today and even things like the phenomena of Fortnite. I can't tell you how much I had kids talking about Fortnite and how they were up to two and three in the morning, yet they couldn't be bothered to log into their assignment and complete any of their homework. And again, this constantly goes back to the conversation of values. My students valued Fortnite and they valued TikTok. So they would spend hours and hours and hours, focused hours, mind you, learning all about Fortnite and excelling in that. They might spend hours and hours and hours learning different dances and editing TikTok videos because that is what they valued. But they wouldn't even spend 10 minutes on my reading programs where I could literally log in and see what they did. They wouldn't even do it. You ever take a smartphone away from a 20 something? They don't know what to do. They look like they got hit with a shovel. It's like. <laughs> I should have learned how to talk to people. <laughs> the text never ends either. It's non stop. Did you know in Seattle? I'm not making this up. There's a public service campaign going on. It's on the buses, in the newspapers, on the radio stations, telling young people you cannot text 911. You have to call and use your voice. <laughs> I wish I was making that up <laughs> because apparently they've had trouble with it. Much like my line of questioning in a Zoom class, I expect this letter to go largely ignored and for my own self amusement. While hybrid teaching has been fun, I found a job as human chum for the SeaWorld shark exhibit that I find more enjoyable and ironically still more safe. I have been teaching with the school district for 14 years, although the bags under my eyes would indicate it has been closer to 40, and the stress in my jaw would suggest post-death rigor mortis. When I came into teaching, I was optimistic and full of life. One would say I uh, arrived like Simba on Pride Rock, and now I find myself leaving like Mufasa in the Stampede, and I'm pretty sure I ate a grub or two in the school lunch over the years. What contributed to this decline, you may ask? 
Well, for starters, every year I was given new guidelines, new curriculum, new training, and never a chance to perfect it. I spent much of this time in PD, and so much so I would more accurately describe it as prison detail. Over the years, we have shuffled Blooms, Marzano, Understanding by Design, and many more. Uh, we get a new strategy, it seems, more often than Kim Kardashian gets a new husband. Teachers have heard so much LEQ, UEQ, and DBQ that we can only sit back and ask D-A-F-U-Q. Also, in the last 14 years, we have gone from an iPhone 1 to the iPhone 12, and yet my testing generator I need for my class has the same specs as the original Oregon Trail. It is becoming clear to me that I will die of dysentery before I get any of my tech updated. While leaving my job may take a financial toll on me, I am fortunate enough to have thought ahead and saved up six garbage bags of aluminum cans that I can turn in for recycling and cover the loss of my school paycheck. I would like to thank the higher-ups for defending me from parents in the same way they would defend me from a tornado by handing me an umbrella. While I clearly will miss the students, hopefully the substitute, and ooh, auto-corrected the sucker, I'll keep it. In charge, we'll have no problem socially distancing my 37 children packed into a 125 square foot room while the rest of the state can't even have a birthday party over 10 people. I have completed the required paperwork and would gladly turn it into the uh, local offices if they were not closed for the same fear of COVID that you have forced us back into. Therefore, I will be leaving my resignation letter in the only place that I know the school board members will actually see it, attached to the county football game schedule. The good news is, if the past years have taught me anything, it is that if 20 years from now I still miss my job, I know I can go right back into teaching as if nothing has changed, because I know, literally, nothing will have changed. <laughs> Heck, might even have some of the same students still. I'm sure it has something to do with somebody questioning your rating as a school and principals trying to have the best rating possible. I'm sure it has a lot to do with a lot of things that have nothing to do with protecting the teacher and the students. Exactly. And so when you're thinking about reporting students, I think that leads right into our next one is Black, Latino, and low-income students whose disproportionate rates of delinquency, poverty, and incarceration correlate with disproportionate rates of illiteracy and difficulty in school. Shortly after Professor Culkin's postcard from a journey was released, the superintendent of the Aldean Independent School District in Texas made just this point on social media when she asked if Culkin's would be, quote, handing out refunds for all the intervention needed for the missed learning opportunity. Our most vulnerable students, black, brown, poor, and special education students, she said, paid the ultimate cost. So what does this add up to for K through 12 education in the United States? Let's turn from Professor Lucy Calkin's postcard from a journey to the report card on a nation, the 2019 National Report on Educational Progress. Here we find that only 36% of public high school seniors are proficient in reading, 25% in writing, 24% in math, and 11% in American history. And as bad as those numbers are, they are even worse when we focus solely on kids coming from minority and low-income communities. In 2019, only 15% of black eighth graders were rated proficient in reading. Only 5% rated proficient in geography and history. So you might well ask, given their horrendous record in K-12 education, especially where low-income and minority students are concerned, how is it that ed school graduates were ever allowed to take on leadership roles in higher education in, of all things, social justice and educational equity? But yeah, so we've got a societal issue with parenting. And then we have all these mandates coming down from Congress, basically saying, teachers, you have to all teach the same thing. You have to take this benchmark, this benchmark. Let me describe you what my last job was. This was a job that I quit. Kids that might exhibit behaviors, they might be destroying things. They might be hitting or harming teachers and they just don't have any consequences. And I think this is one of the 
biggest problems because the amount of stories that we had on out of control on like I'm like a, getting angry thinking about yeah, it it's like out of control on like a child that might have hit a teacher or something and they go to the principal's office and they leave with a lollipop this was one of the stories they left with a lollipop from the principal's office Could after you imagine hitting the te- and biting the teacher i think it was biting the teacher leaving marks and then the child I feel angry thinking about this. The child came in and took the lollipop that she had in her mouth and stuck it in another child's hair. Mm -hmm. And then after school, the principal said that she shouldn't report it because the bite mark did not break skin. It bruised, (laughs) but it did not break skin. Let me just also say something that Brie also touched upon is that just because a child has an IEP does not excuse bad behavior. I am mm-hmm. so sorry. I am so sorry for parents, for children, for teachers, for administrators who believe that having an IEP excuses anybody, never excuses anybody from behaviors like that, that are, that are violent and, and that could hurt others. That is inexcusable ever honestly like we try and teach our students the same values that we would have taught to anybody you have to not harm other people (laughs) you have to be kind you know and a lot of times when they think they can get away with things we figure it out as a team with their parents no 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 there's no way a child should be doing that and yours should not be either so we need to figure this out i had an experience like in my first couple of years teaching and a parent had actually said, well, I think you're too hard, you know, on my, on my child because he has autism. And I said, let me tell you something about your child. He is smart. He is very smart. And he is so capable of understanding consequences that exist within our school community. And he can do it. And let me tell you, by the end of that school year, that parent had learned just like know, give healthy, me- just healthy boundaries and discipline. And I feel like by the end of the school year, I was like, all right, yeah, you don't have to punish them that hard. (laughs) Like five minutes out of a game is fine. There are just some things that parents and media perpetuate like, oh, this, you know, this child has this, so they cannot possibly, and they just undervalue how intelligent all children are. They just, they invalidate all of that. And they they know how to get, they know how to get away with a lot of things. They sure do. They sure do. They know exactly how long their meltdown has to be in order for you to give in, to give them their Mm -hmm. iPad. I'll tell you that. And I think that that's why admin support is so important. I would come early, like school started at 840. I'd be there, I would leave my house at like 630. I would get there at like seven. I would do grading or whatever plan, lesson planning takes forever. I would do lesson planning and then I would have the kids all day. And then I would have to stay after usually for a couple hours. And then I would have grading and then procrastinate grading and then oh and you're required to have eight daily grades and two test grades every six weeks you're required to monitor progress on all 30 special ed students in your caseload every six weeks so pull them out for testing and all that stuff lastly the amount of testing is absurd the last year i taught we received an email successfully applauding us for administering over twenty-seven thousand tests in a single school year That's not an accomplishment. It's an abomination. Kids don't take the test seriously when there's that many of them, and it takes away valuable classroom time. Not to mention, forcing a teacher to stand in a silent testing room for hours just gives us more time to plot our escape. And it's like, when you have time to eat, sleep, or breathe, like there's so much. So most teachers, I'd say their biggest complaints are the workload, it's a lot. Dealing with student behavior in their classroom is huge. Like I said, I love my students, but with reservations, like there are a lot of them that I flat out didn't like. These kids will push your buttons and actually none of them for my last school, I love I them. Um, but I, will, I remembered one. 
yeah, these kids will sit, they'll flip their pencil, they'll, they'll scream at you and you can't get anything done. So you're expected to take their test and be going at this pace and teaching all this stuff in this short amount of time. And then you have a kid disrupting your classroom all day and you can't get anything done. And then you have like a, the rest are like apathetic and they don't care to do anything. They just want to come and sit and like whip out their phone and get on YouTube from with their headphones in with their hoodie up whenever they get a chance. It's like these kids don't want to be there. We have a culture of like disrespect for education. We're so entitled as a society. Like we don't realize our our parents parents like our forefathers came here and wanted education like they would walk like uphill both ways to school to be able to sit in a classroom with one teacher and like learn and learn how to read they wanted this knowledge I knew they were better off with it and now we just take it for granted and but it, like at the same time the curriculum is super boring so I don't really blame them we can't do fun things in our classroom because we don't have money for it. We can't go on field trips because there's no money for it. Like there's no fun in school anymore. And then teacher, with teachers having to buy their own supplies, yeah, you're going to be doing like computer work and pen and paper work. There's no, there's no money for fun. So it's, yeah, it's bad. And then the other thing teachers complain about is administration. So at the school I was at before, my principal ended up getting fired. Not the good school. I've been at three schools. The second school, one of the desk flipper. She ended up getting fired halfway through the year. And so like she just didn't care. So she was like really absent and and the kids were running amok and crazy and there was no discipline and she had like a culture of the kids getting sent down and this principal would literally call this the teacher like a b word and send the student back and the student would be like oh well, miss blah 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 told me that you're a and like sometimes they would be holding lollipops sometimes they would be having like snacks and then they would sit and be like oh you, do you want a snack you need to go to see the principal she'll give you a snack like Oh my gosh, so it's up to the teacher to control everything in her own classroom. And that gets really hard if you don't have an administration that is on the same page with you or learning discipline or who like undermines you. It's really hard to get anything done because kids are gonna misbehave. Like it's it's extreme mis misbehavior and disrespect is what I see um, most from these kids towards their teachers. And I was like really lucky. I my te my kids liked me i'm younger you know and um and i kind of banter with them and i have like a, a sarcastic personality and so they really like that but like a lot of these poor teachers who were just like older and had been doing it for a long time were just burnt out the kids are just so cruel like they can see the meanest things and it's really heartbreaking so hug a teacher thank them tell them how much you love them and america let's get this under control because the schools need more funding and education should be a priority in this country. And when children come into school with these behaviors that are so extreme, what is it that we are doing to alleviate and or teach boundaries and consequences? And from what I've read and from what we've experienced, it's nothing. From what we've heard, they're getting lollipops and they're saying, do better next time. It's just one day you could try again tomorrow, which is great and dandy, not when they're punching and biting teachers. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I'm like, this is why teachers are quitting. You're getting beat up and abused, having things thrown at you, yet who's the one that gets in trouble? The teacher, because it's your fault that that happened. You should have de-escalated the situation. You should have done it. Yeah. And you know, honestly, like I feel like if teachers were to quit, they usually quit at the end of the school year. But no, these teachers now are just quitting because they just can't take it. They can't even wait until June to do it or May, whenever schools end. Right. It's that bad. Bree put out a question and she asked everyone, what is it that we think needs to be done to make schools better? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> yes. Um, if you're a lawmaker, if you're a person that has control over us, please take out your pen and your paper and take some notes. We're going over note taken. <laughs> resources, your money does not need to go into a new curriculum that we have to learn. The new workshops that you want to give us, the art supplies that have funding for, the, not refrigerator, the, um, what is it called? The, the furniture to hold things. Cause let me tell you, our school has allotted money for certain things. And they've got a lot of money for random things. Please use this money to invest in the people that teach the children. If education is so freaking important to you, you need to invest in the educators. They should go into making classroom sizes smaller. Hire that special education teacher. 
hire that behavioral interventionist, hire that extra teacher so that teachers aren't overwhelmed with 30 and 30 or more kids in the class. Hire that extra guidance counselor so you can have more crisis intervention. There are so many things you can do to alleviate this stress that the teachers are going through. So many things. Ooh, you know what we need is we need administrators who were once teachers, right? Like, cause in my head, it would be like you and I, we know what's going on. We know what they need, so on and so forth. But literally everyone was like, oh, they are. And I was like, what? Did they just forget everything they endured in the classroom and they just walked into this position and act like everything is just hunky dory? Or I don't even know what that phrase I mean, means. We're also not trying to diminish the job of the admin because I know that they deal with a lot. They do, but, but come on. But. Some of these decisions that you're making, administrators don't answer to teachers. In fact, they don't really care what teachers think. In my opinion, based on what I've read, they don't, they don't. What they care about is how their school looks and grades. What they care about is how parents respond because parents also have a say in how the school looks and grades. And when I say grades, it's how a school is rated. Like when you move to a new neighborhood and you check out a school's rating, parents, mm -hmm. teachers- You want and, those test scores up. Yeah, that's who, that's who votes and rates a school. If administrators are pushing back on parents saying to discipline your children and yes, they can come to school if they're behaving this way, then that would definitely cause a parent to rate a school lower than a principal who's saying, you know what, they can just try better next time and have this lollipop. Try not to bite your teacher tomorrow. Things like that. And I'm, I'm just making that inference for myself. Someone's principal actually said in a meeting, if you rate our school poorly, then you can just get out. Ma'am, whomever, excuse me? These are the people who work under you. Can, you. Does that you can write your opinion, but it has to be the opinion I want you to write. Crazy how administrators are so brazen to say these things to the people who they're supposed to inspire to work, you know, together with them. And this is what they're saying to their teachers. It's kind of like a threat. It's not kind of, it is a threat. It is a threat. So if you take anything from this, it's leave a paper trail, ladies and gentlemen, leave a paper trail. Always put it in an email. Okay. Trust me, you won't regret it. So you thought the first story of me getting fired for 48 hours is a little crazy. Nothing on this one. This is the craziest teacher story that I have. It keeps getting more nuts. Trust me, follow along on this one. So it's 2007. I got hired to teach intensive reading for seniors in high school. Basically, these students have not passed the reading portion of the state exam over and over again. They've taken this class over and over again, and they've been unsuccessful. I come in, I'm a young teacher, I'm 21. Most of my students are 18, 19. I'm making connections, I'm trying new strategies. They're really feeling it. I think for sure this is going to be great. I get my test results back. 70% of my students pass the state exam. And I was a little defeated. I thought that was really low until I talked to the other teachers. There were three other teachers teaching this particular uh, class. And, and they told me that their passing rate was like 20 and 30%. And it had always been that low. And it, that's why they keep having to retake. So it was tremendous that I got a score this high. And I was, I was on cloud nine. So next day I get called into the office. I sit down with my principal and my principal tells me that I'm being laid off. And I was like, what? I, like I'm, I'm being laid off or did I do something wrong? No, I did everything right, too right in fact. 70% of my students passed, so there were no students being left over really from my class to take the test next year, so they didn't need my class anymore. They could consolidate it into the other teachers. And since they had been there uh, longer, they had seniority, some had tenure, and I did not. I was the first one to go, despite me having the highest test scores. So here's where it gets a little crazier. I get a piece of paper saying, sorry, we're laying you off, which I asked for, by the way. I just wanted it in writing, you know? I, and and I, get, uh, I get home feeling defeated, but I start putting in applications to teach elsewhere. Nowhere's biting. Summer comes, summer passes, my checks dry up. I'm still applying to teach somewhere, you know, but it's recession starting. I decided to file for unemployment because I wasn't getting paid anymore and I'm still trying to find a job and I need a roof over my head. And about a month and a half later, there's a knock at my door. 
I open up the door and I'm being served papers from the school board because they are suing me for wrongfully claiming unemployment. They want all of the unemployment wages back and they want their court fees and attorney costs as well. It came out to like over five grand for a month and a half of unemployment that they were suing me for. Now that was ludicrous to me because I had the paper saying I got laid off. Case closed, right? So uh, the court date's like a month and a half out. All of a sudden, I get a piece of paper in the mail and the piece of paper says the judgment was ruled against me. And I was like, what are you talking about? We never had the court date. The court date was hasn't came yet. And it turns out they did change the court date. They moved it up. And guess how they notified me? Via school email. The school email that I no longer had access to because they laid me off. And so I never got the notification. So I appeal to the judge. The judge grants my appeal. I show up to this, this meeting and the judge is there. The attorneys for the school board are there. They go on this rant about how I was fired and I, I was fired because I didn't have reading certifications. By the way, the same reading certifications that they fired me for three years later. Oh my gosh, go back to the first video. They said I didn't have the certifications, but I did have the certification and I knew I did. And anyways, I handed that paper over to the judge. The judge looked at it and she's like, um, yeah, it, it says here that uh, you were clearly laid off. And the attorney said, yeah, no comment. They knew they laid me off. They didn't even argue it. They didn't even fight it. They just were hoping that I didn't have the paper anymore and they could collect their money back. I was unbelievable to me. Now here's the craziest part of this whole story. So when I first got the letter that I was being sued, I couldn't find that letter that said that I was laid off. I looked all over for it. I couldn't find it. And, and I was pretty nervous that I wouldn't find it. So I sent an email to my old principal and I said, hey, you know, I, hi, remember me, you, you, you laid me off. Um, listen, I was wondering, do you have a copy of that letter that we signed in your office? Uh, they're wanting unemployment. And if you could just, even if you could just type a response to this and be like, yeah, I laid him off. Nothing, no response back. I emailed several times, luckily, I finally found the paper right before the court date and I was like, okay, fine, I got the paper. I don't need his email anymore. Get this, the judgment is ruled in my favor. I get to keep the unemployment, which by the way, I don't get to counter uh, to get my court costs back, but that's beside the point. About a week after they ruled in my favor, I get an email from the principal that laid me off that said, hey, how are you? Uh, look, we need a reading teacher this year. Turns out we had higher enrollment than we expected. Would you be willing to come back to teach here? Oh, what? You, you left me to dry when they were taking me to court. You're the one that laid me off. You ignored my messages. And now you want me to come work for you again because suddenly you have higher enrollment count and you need another teacher? Why, so I can be successful again and then looking for a job in a year? You are out of your mind. I just, anyways, that's probably the craziest teacher story that I have. Uh, I love reading your stories, so keep them coming. Leave a paper trail, ladies and gentlemen. Leave a paper trail. Always put it in an email, okay? Trust me, you won't regret it. People are all born ignorant, but they are not born stupid. Much of the stupidity we see today is induced by our educational system, from the elementary schools to the universities. In a high-tech age that has seen the creation of artificial intelligence by computers, we are also seeing the creation of artificial stupidity by people who call themselves educators. Educational institutions created to pass on to the next generation the knowledge, experience, and culture of the generations that went before them have instead been turned into indoctrination centers to promote whatever notions, fashions, or ideologies happen to be in vogue among today's intelligentsia. The experiences of life can help people outgrow whatever they were indoctrinated with. What may persist, however, is the lazy habit of hearing one side of an issue and being galvanized into action without hearing the other side. And more fundamentally, 
not having developed any mental skills that would enable you to systematically test one set of beliefs against another. It was once the proud declaration of many educators that we are here to teach you how to think, not what to think. But far too many of our teachers and professors today are teaching their students what to think about everything from global warming to the new trinity of race, class, and gender. Even if all the conclusions with which they indoctrinate their students were 100% correct, that would still not be equipping students with the mental skills to weigh opposing views for themselves in order to be prepared for new and unforeseeable issues that will arise over their lifetimes after they leave the schools and colleges. Many of today's educators not only supply students with conclusions, they promote the idea that students should spring into action because of these prepackaged conclusions. When we see children in elementary schools out carrying signs in demonstrations, we are seeing the kind of mindless groupthink that causes adults to sign petitions they don't understand, or, worse yet, follow leaders they don't understand, whether to the White House, the Kremlin, or Jonestown. Oh, well, uh, here you go, boys. These will help you protest. It's good to see that you care about peace, boys. Okay. Excuse me, boys. Tom Stoutzel, HBC News. Can you tell me why you kids marched out of school today? Uh, war? Right. What about the war? No blood for oil. Yeah, war is not my voice. You kids don't know squat about America, do you? Well, not really, no. Well, that's just jangles. A philosopher once said that the most important knowledge is knowledge of one's own ignorance. That is the knowledge that too many of our schools and colleges are failing to teach our young people. It takes a certain amount of knowledge just to understand the extent of one's own ignorance. But our educators have given assignments to children not yet a decade old to write letters to members of Congress or to presidents, spouting off on issues ranging from nuclear weapons to medical care. Will Rogers once said that it was not ignorance that was so bad, but all the things we know that ain't so. But our classroom indoctrinators are getting students to think that they know after hearing only one side of an issue. It is artificial stupidity. Let's dive in. With 4th of July coming up, we're talking to students and young Americans about the history of the holiday. Do they even know what the 4th of July means? What date we got our independence and who we got our independence from? Let's find out. So with the 4th of July coming up, we're gonna ask a couple questions. My first question for you guys is, what does the 4th of July commemorate? <laughs> the day we uh, declared independence from Great Britain. Basically America's birthday, right? I think independence. What year did we declare our independence? Think? I'm gonna be real with you, I don't know. 19. 67, I'll say. Close, a what little the? off. I don't know, 1859. 1964. I'm going to give you a try. What do you think? What year did we get our independence? 1970 something, 74, something like that. 19. 19 oh my. What? No. Can, can, we, can we see that again? I think what year did we get our independence? 1970 something, 74, something like that. 1979? Like the 1800s. 1864? Shut yes, up. like, Shut like up. 18. 19. Is like, farther no, back? Like, like 18. It's further back. From the 1800s? Oh, shit. 1777? 76, 76. So we're actually very two interesting people to talk to. We're teachers. <laughs> so I was a seventh. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This could go really, really good or it could go really, really horribly. What do y'all think? For, before we continue on, is it going to go good or is it going to go bad? Now, don't cheat. Now, obviously, you can cheat. You can just fast forward in the video and see what their answer was. But... Let's 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 see how how many of y'all get the answer right. I'm gonna guess it's gonna go horribly. They aren't even gonna know the answer. And these two ladies are teaching the next generation. We're teachers, <laughs> so I was a seventh grade civics uh, teacher, government teacher, and she's oh. an elementary school teacher, fourth grade, second grade elementary school teacher. What year did we get our independence? <laughs> 17 something. Who did we get our independence Hold from? Hold on, wait. What who country? said that? I don't know. Which which one of them said seven? 17 something. Who did we get our independence from? What country? I don't know. I don't know this question. I don't know. America? What? Oh, Britain. Great Britain or something like that. Um, England. What was the name of the war that we were fighting at the time? The Civil War? The French Revolution, right? The Civil War? The Industrial Revolution. Yo. Oh my goodness. Right? I think they, they, No, 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 no. They, they. <laughs> 
I'm laughing, but this this is sad. We need to do an investigation on these classrooms. There needs to be an investigation on what is being taught in these classrooms, K through 12, and then also in college, because this, this is just absolutely ridiculous. This is just absolutely ridiculous. Do you guys feel like you were taught enough about this in school? Do you guys feel like you were taught about, about this in a classroom? No, they need better teachers. I feel like because since people think it's history, it doesn't apply to them now, but like history tends to repeat itself. So it's definitely important that you do learn where you come from and to avoid certain things like that now. Everybody should learn about our history. It's our right to know what happened like for our country and why you know why we live the way we do and all of that stuff it's something that's in our history books and like we just flip through you feel me like the teachers don't take time to like really teach it school everything in school is like what they it think quizzes know, like, yeah exactly i just know that teachers do not want to teach it people are very ignorant they think that they know everything society really doesn't care about a lot of things unless it's right in front of their face you get me so i I personally know firsthand that we are not getting taught, specifically in social studies, the history that we need to know. I actually don't teach what's in our curriculum. I'm teaching children social studies that's not in our curriculum, teaching them things about how to be an anti-racist. Instead of teaching those same three famous black people that we continue to teach, I taught them about protesting. I taught them about Black Lives Matter. I taught them about things that are happening currently so that they could make those connections. And when they see it on the news, they're informed. They're not ignoring the facts of our world right now. They're facts that we're actually. So very interesting video there. I mean, what in the world is going on in these classrooms? This is craziness. But I think the last teacher there was very, very telling. If, if you dive deeper into what she said there, she basically said, I'm going outside of the curriculum and I'm teaching them about protesting and BLM. That, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem right there. You just heard it. I'm teaching these kids how to be outraged, how to be angry and mad at the world and look at America as this horrible, terrible, no good, very bad place. And I'm not teaching them about how terrible things are in the rest of the world. So really, things in America are really actually great they're amazing but instead i'm going to teach them how to be outraged and go protest out in the streets and i'm not going to teach them the curriculum now on its surface before she said the the last part you know teaching them about protesting and all that stuff when she first mentioned going outside the curriculum i said hmm maybe that's not so bad of an idea because maybe the curriculum isn't giving the students enough information maybe the curriculum isn't structured properly so the students are leaving schools without the knowledge that they truly need so maybe going outside of that a little bit and teaching them actual things that they need to know would be better but then she said protest and and i think she said she was like a elementary school teacher or something which is even worse what in the world why do kids need to know about this stuff let a kid be a kid let kids need to go outside and play in the dirt you know go play some backyard football or go uh play video games with their friends not learn about protests that teacher should be fired and fired immediately like yesterday like not only are you going outside the curriculum but you're teaching them bs i don't know y'all y'all let me know in the comment section but that that is just crazy these students not knowing these answers i'm sure if you asked an immigrant those questions they would know I'm sure if you ask some people from other countries that don't even live here in America, they would know those, some of those answers, if not all of those answers, which is sad. That's the sad, you got people in America, students that don't even know this stuff. And I'm sure people in other countries know it. Absolutely crazy. We need to, we, we need investigation on these schools and what they are teaching because something is, is terribly going wrong in these classrooms absolutely and i think that last teacher there was very very telling as to at least one aspect of it all this has been my first year in preschool with a class of my own teaching alongside another queer neurodivergent educator and we have been rocking our twos class we've been talking about gender and skin color and consent and empathy and our bodies and autonomy it's been fabulous this class is incredible and i am so impressed Yeah, well, a lot of it is is teenage immaturity. Absolutely, I think encouraged, unfortunately, by many parents who are who coddle them right now. And by faculty, 
and, and by faculty and encouraged by faculty. But there are faculty, of course, who are constrained and afraid to talk about gender or diversity issues or who are penalized for talking about that. So, so it's, there is some, I think the immature children are a large part of it, but I worry that, that the immature children include many administrators at universities. <laughs> it is, there are plenty of cases, uh, even of, of people who've resigned and can't handle it, don't want to live like this. When basically debate is openly discouraged, I think that's, I mean, you might as well just close down the university. <laughs> It should be completely open. In fact, let's go back to the excesses of cancel culture. I mean, suppose somebody's invited to the university as views you don't like. The worst reaction is to drive them off campus, wrong in principle and tactically suicidal. The right answer is to say, fine, from the campus, We'll come to your talk and raise questions. We'll set up an alternative session where we look into the things that you've written and discuss them and analyze them. It's an educational experience. It's an opportunity for an educational experience. Let's use the opportunity. We yeah, in fact, it's an opportunity to also to to learn that you may be wrong. <laughs> I mean, that's all that, you know, that the person actually may have some make, making some sense. Some people might say that before the internet, there was a limitation on free speech imposed from above. You have very limited access to information. But the internet has dem democratized information and previously marginalized people are now able to make themselves heard more effectively. And in some cases, they control the debate. So what do you think about this claim that the internet in some sense has improved the situation by allowing marginalized people now to speak out and also get information they didn't get before. Overall assessment might be negative. It has tremendous positive potential, but it's had a very mixed effect. Yeah, I, I think that tend to think that there, you know, it's a vast source of information, but it's a vast source of misinformation. And the tools to distinguish between the two are something that a lot of people either don't have or don't want to have, and we don't teach in schools. The tools should be serious education. Yeah. So we go back to what's happening in the educational institution. One of the things they ought to be doing is teaching serious critical inquiry. And unfortunately, part of the neoliberal programs of the past 40 years have been to undermine public education seriously. Everything from charm mm -hmm. to turning the educational curriculum from kindergarten on up to uh, rote learning and uh, teaching to test, which is absolutely the worst kind of teaching. This is part of an incidental. The Obama administration was in the forefront of it. Yeah. The teachers were told they just can't let students pursue their own interests, which is what an education ought to do, because they have to make sure they can pass the next day. And we all know from our own experience, you can take a course you have no interest in. Yeah. Last week, you cram for the test and pass the test, and a couple weeks later, you forgot what the course was about. Yeah. So, education has become standard, and the defunding is very serious. State colleges and universities, particularly, have been seriously harmed by just sharp withdrawal of any funding. Hello and welcome to The Misery Machine, where I take you on wonderful journeys across the internet, mainly TikTok, because TikTok is what everybody's using and it is the best medium right now to see into the minds of the mentally unstable. And this is coming from someone who's been in a psych ward, so I call it like I see it. I know crazy when I see it. I was in a cell. <laughs> He's hateful. He's this and that. No, nope, went to a psych ward. I know crazy. Crazy knows crazy. I'm like the Riddler. And I'm looking through my cell seeing the Joker lick the walls. Anyway, um, gender. Remember when there used to be two? I'm gonna kill myself! I'm going to kill myself and it's your fault! Wow, those are such great days. Five years ago. Remember five years ago when life was semi-normal? You could go outside and hang out and no one gave you pronouns? Well, too bad. There, I had fun 20 years ago. <laughs> when I 
I can still smoke indoors? Oh, I got ecstasy still pure, uncut, and readily available? Get ready for button self, kitten self, bug self, and every other crap some ass you think of that you have to now swallow because it's politically correct. It's politically correct to entertain machinations of insanity. I just added bug to my list of pronouns. So here is a very quick tutorial on how to use bug bugs pronouns in sentences. Okay, let's go. I'm meeting up with my friend Moth later. Uh, but who, who, wait. you know, back in the day, kids like this didn't make it to adulthood. At some point they'd stepped in front of like a diesel truck and that was the end of them. This is hate crimes. <laughs> this is a hate crime against me. This is hate against rationality, isn't it? Can't I have a movement? Can I not? I want a flag. And it just says, be goddamn rational on it. It's not much of a flag, but it's self-explanatory. Do you say bugs for multiple people? Oh, God, America is burning down, man. This keeps up. Whatever, screw it. I'll be dead by the time the Russians and the Chinese take over. I <laughs> so, yeah, if you guys haven't... Even she knows this is dumb. I mean, even Bug Self knows this. How do you... How do you use these pronouns? Even Bug knows this is dumb. There we go. Any questions? Um, that is how you use Bug, Bug, Bug Self pronouns. Uh, Can't even remember their own Bug, Bug logic. <laughs> this has got to be fake. Because <laughs> it seems like every day on TikTok, some other oddly dressed sexually dubious human being props up with some new identity culture you're supposed to swallow like a sh little jagged pill and i'm always willing to answer questions about my pronouns i'm on my land we're both in america which used to be a good country until they started letting people like you do whatever you want let's go bun bun hi everyone my name is bunny i use bun pronouns i identify as gender fey what does being gender fey mean Gender fey is a type of non-binary gender fluid identity that ranges between uh, agender and feminine with no feelings of masculinity. There is no Remember when effeminate and gay dudes used to dress really well? They had a great sense of style. This isn't working for Bunny. I don't know if it's supposed to be a man or a woman anymore. Gender fey person, non-binary. It's just, it's not working. Those chokers, no, they clash with the goddamn shirt mama. For God's sakes, take notes from Robert Plant. Robert Plant could wear blouses, women's blouses on stage, and still look rocking. Somehow, this person can't seem to pick up on the magic of the song remains the same. In the never-ending race for internet clout and seeming more interesting than you actually are, Nothing is the more next generation move than being transhuman or not identifying as human. Though I highly doubt any of these people pay attention to Norse mythology or anything outside of pop culture Zoomer retardation. But there is a fantastic quote from Carnilla that she once said to Loki who dared peer beyond the veil. There is no more bitter burden than to find out that oneself is less than unique and there is no more a greater curse than to know one's ultimate fate. But don't worry, Zoomers on TikTok aren't self-aware. They're, I don't know what the hell they're doing. And this is how many years ago? This was December 7th, 2017. Wow, okay, I'm ready. Okay, headline, a tale of two Columbia classes. Hi, Professor Height. I'm a second year undergrad philosophy major at Columbia and a fan of your work on moral psychology. I couldn't help but share the following anecdote. Two of my courses this semester differ from one another, from another greatly. One is an intro philosophy course required by all philosophy majors in which we read classic papers in the philosophy of mind, identity, and morality. The other is called philosophy and feminism in which we learn the core principles of intersectional feminism and queer theory. Okay, standard opening, two mm -hmm. courses. I remember those courses, yeah. Okay. Now, leaving aside the differences in content, the courses differ in how they're run. In the intro class, we'll read a philosopher, say Thomas Nagel, learn his arguments well enough, well enough to repeat them, and then spend the majority of the class exposing any weaknesses in Nagel's argument. We deem no philosopher's views sacred or even special. We even debate one another. Um, I disagree with the professor all the time. It's lively, good-natured, and fun. Mm -hmm. Every Monday and Wednesday, I leave that class and go straight to philosophy and feminism, where the social mood is very different. We read some thinker, say Foucault, 
and not a single person even asks a question to say nothing of a critique. What few comments are made invariably reify the ideas of the thinker, and if someone does make a critique, the professor has a hand-waving way of answering without ever suggesting that the argument could have a weakness. Uh, some highlights of the course, okay? The professor once said that all students of color are victims of oppression, and you say, I'm black and I view myself in no such way, but I didn't say that in the moment because it would have felt combative in that room. She once suggested that people not come to class so that they could attend a protest that was happening elsewhere on campus. She once compared privilege to sin and remarked about how nice it would be if we could cleanse ourselves of it. And then you say, you of course, cherry pick the most bizarre example, da da da. You say, the class is church like in two ways. One, it feels mean to disagree, even politely, so nobody does. And two, it's boring to sit through if you don't already agree with what's being taught. Anyway, I thought this was just so remarkable for a sophomore in, if it's just a sophomore or college student. And you had no typos, everything was perfectly, uh, you know. Yeah, well, speaking of philosophy departments, uh, here's a question. Studies show that a quarter of American academics working in the fields of humanities are in favor of excluding colleagues who have a wrong opinion about controversial subjects like immigration or the difference between the sexes. Would you agree that the English and American universities have a particular problem with the freedom of speech? Just as they always have. Like the, you go back to the McCarthy period. I mean, there were occasional cases of scientists, mathematicians who were subjected to the uh, massive uh, attack on universities, but not very much. Sciences have been protected by the fact that in the sciences, you can't get away with utter nonsense. Not yet. I mean, if you decide that uh, you don't believe theory of relativity, you're not going to be able to teach physics. And well, I, I do worry about the teaching of science. To worry about, but it's, it's immediately detected in the sciences as something improper. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The sciences. It's the norm. It literally is the norm. Uh, people get their PhD in some small area. They carve out an area of expertise. You know, they pursue that for the rest of their lives and they never want to hear anything else. That's not unusual and you can easily do it in the humanities and social sciences and even be called a curious, important scholar. You just don't have the protective effect of the truth leaping at your throat all the time. The decay of American society is painfully evident, just in case you somehow missed it. I don't know how could you. Inflation, gas prices, food prices, everything's just absolutely miserable. Then you throw TikTok into the mix. Then you get pundits who decide to dance in January about the blue skies that awaited us. And now we're looking dead smack at the darkest dawn. But in spite of all that, the teachers of America have been going out of their way to make sure that the students know everything about being trans, non-binary, and transhuman, and... Trixic, toric, feminomoric, viramoric, allosexual. Whatever other bullshit you can think of. Okay. My gender is... Oh. Rather than teaching the children. This TikTok channel specializes in showing you just how far gone the kids are. But don't worry, they probably know their gender pronouns, and that's what's really important. Can you name three countries besides the USA? Well, she probably has a bright future doing OnlyFans, so what the hell does she need to know that there's more than three countries in the world? Holy Jesus Christ. Still, I can't keep doing this. It kills me. Wait, aren't countries in... No, wait, yeah? No. Wait. Wow. Do you know what year the U.S. was founded? That I don't know. You f kidding me, dude. 1776. What's wrong with these kids? I mean, I was a bad student. But this is a whole other level. This is like, do all the kids have autism now? I know it's a trend on TikTok where everybody's like, I'm neurodivergent and I have autism. Maybe it's for real. Neurodivergent. Take a guess what year. You can do it, girl. Just think. Use that brain. 1965? Yes. 1965! 
Uh, in a country like America, I think of how much dysfunction we have here, how much mental illness. Through a lot of this country, it's just like you have neighborhood after neighborhood and community after community of poverty and destitution and lack of education. And you see the same people getting into the same problems and the same things over and over again. On top of that, pretty much everyone who goes to public school talks about how much they hate public school, right? I mean, nobody oh, really, the K through 12 started. system, you know, no one really has anything good to say about the K through 12 system. At most, they'll say, I liked my teachers or I had a good, like I had a really good fourth grade teacher. Like yeah, but, It's not inspiring. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> um, it's not actually teaching us to be either self-reliant in an individual sense and how that pertains to, to let's say, a civilization or society at large they've never done a, this the civics the government the history it's it, it's long been very shallow and very simplistic and it's of necessity i suppose because yeah, well, what, what i realized was you know as i've gotten older like i always had this kind of difficult relationship with education because i i like learning and i like talking about big ideas but I mean, when I was younger, I wasn't a good student. Um, and then eventually oh, I like, <laughs> I, eventually I learned how to conform and be a good student and do oh, all the Well, you have to. You know what happens if you, you don't? Do. They, they, if you don't, they punish you and they also do other things. Like when I was in school, I had a similar experience. It wasn't stimulating. If I had already had enough experiences outside, you know, my dad would take me, he'd be like, all right, you know, you're out of school for a month. We're going to Mexico, we'd go on road trips and we travel and we'd see things and we'd do things. So, you know, my memories of school were like the best parts about it were leaving it. And the worst parts were always coming back. And I saw the way other people acted. And it's like, I could never do that, at least for a good portion, you know, for many years as a youth. And then you know what they had to do inevitably is that you know now i think it's not politically correct but they used to call it learning disability ld class so mm -hmm. they put me in there i now, was in it, similar classes in elementary school yes right and as as you know we had no business being in there if intelligent students get put in learning disability in the system then the system it seems to be what creates the learning disability so like when i look at modern america I never bought into education the way I see other people buy into it. It looks to me like what they failed to do with me, it looks like they successfully did with everyone else. And that was to put them in learning disability class. That's what I think of when I think of American education. Now, obviously we have intelligent people and we have colleges, which are have their own set of issues. I don't know. No, oh, you know, take a guess. Russia. Mount Rushmore is in Russia. What country is Mount Rushmore in? Canada. Canada. This has got to be fake. I can't do this anymore, dude. How much longer? I give up. I can't even make jokes anymore. The fact the black dude's like candidate, he's got a smile on his face. Like, what do you think? Yes. <laughs> Are you stupid? <laughs> Are you stupid? It has the president of the United States on it. It's Canada. Biggest ass it is Canada. It is Canada. You're dumb as <laughs> Whoa, really? Really? It's Canada. <laughs> Bro, it's this one. No, no, it's not. It's 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 you in our retarded. Mount Rushmore. It's in Vermont. Vermont. <laughs> Vermont is in the U.S. I, there's so many layers. The fact he says Canada, then he moves to Vermont like Vermont is part of Canada, but then technically Vermont isn't far from Canada if you wanted to cross the border. But my head hurts. It hurts. I can't even make a joke of this. Those are adults. Those aren't little kids. How long is a quarter of an hour? I don't even know. That's it. Quarter of an hour, bro. Half an hour is 30 minutes, playboy. You cut 30 minutes in half, that's 15 minutes. Come on, dog. A quarter of an hour? Yeah. yeah. Why is he doing this? Why is he sitting there going like, yeah? It's just like reaffirming these people's stupidity. <laughs> All right, next question, next question. No, guess the number. <laughs> I don't know, bro. Guess a number, <laughs> zero to 60. Say it again. Zero to fifty. What's a quarter of an hour? Fifty. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Now I'm done. The hell with this, Stu. I can't even make jokes no more. Oh my head! It hurts. It genuinely hurts. Don't put your kids in public school. That's what this video basically says. If you have kids, do not put them in public school. You will have retarded children that will make bad decisions. They will vote for people who don't know where they are. No wonder, like, for real, I'm not trying to be political, but, like, the White House is really pursuing TikTok stars to appeal to young people. And this is why. Because they don't know nothing. It's easy to trick somebody who thinks a quarter of an hour 
is 50 minutes. It's easy to trick someone who thinks Vermont's in Canada or they think Mount Rushmore's in Russia. You can manipulate these people. They don't know nothing. That's how you win. You, you get the stupid on your side. That's how the church won back in the days. What are your preferred pronouns? Uh, they, them. These are not my preferred pronouns. These are my pronouns. Mappa, Nini, Nopa, Nori, Opa, Pere, Pom Pom, Zaza, Zizi. They, them, theirs. They're customizable. Anything can be a pronoun, really. This is the phenomenon Brown University public health researcher Dr. Lisa Littman called rapid onset gender dysphoria. And it refers to a sudden spike in transgender identification among teen girls with no childhood history of gender dysphoria at all. Not only have the rates of these girls claiming trans identification risen dramatically in the US and all across the West, over 4,400% rise in teen girls presenting for gender treatment at the UK's National Gender Clinic, for instance. But teenage girls are now the leading demographic of those claiming to have gender dysphoria. What's going on? The answer is social contagion. One more instance of teen girls sharing and spreading their pain. There's a long history of peer contagion with this demographic, of course. We know that anorexia and bulimia spread this way. And we know that this demographic, teen girls, is in the midst of the worst mental health crisis on record, with the highest rates of anxiety, self-harm, and clinical depression we've ever seen. We know that the population who tends to fall into social contagions is the same high anxiety, depressive group of girls who struggle socially in adolescence and tend to hate their bodies. Add to that a school environment where you can achieve immediate valorization and popularity by declaring a trans identity, and of course, the delicious temptation to stick it to mom. Neurodivergent noun self pronoun, animal, Noun self pronoun. So gender dysphoria. Is gender euphoria. Androsexual. Gender queer person. Homosexuality. Bi doesn't really fit them. Lesbian doesn't really fit them. Pan. Asexual. Etc. Asexual. Demisexual. And cupiosexual. Ace flux. Asexuality and allosexuals. Neuroqueer. Pan gender. Non asexual aromantic and allosexual aromantic micro labels. People with penises or people with vaginas rather than saying male and female or men and women. Please do not use gendered language to, to address everyone. James Sacramento, he, him. I have a day to run. I don't need this dysphoria right now. Most of the time, I won't have the resources or capabilities to reduce the gender dysphoria because I didn't bring along with me a hat or a binder or makeup if it's the other way around. Hi, everybody. It's your friendly female alter art. And in today's video, we will be switching. Me and Alex will be switching out who is in front in this video. Now, just as a disclaimer, every system is going to switch differently and every switch in every system is going to look differently. Please give us a like because I know we're going to get called fake for this. All right, here goes. Hey everyone, it's Alex from the A system. The reason me and Art can switch so quickly is because we've been in the system the longest. We've both been in the system since early childhood. We have switched tens of thousands of times. Not all the switches in our system are that smooth. For example, the switch between me and Asher is a lot longer than that. Thank you. People are really out here acting like they can't comprehend pronouns. When I grow up, I want to be a principal or a caterpillar. The APA, the American Psychological Association, and they've just published guidelines for treating boys and men. And they describe what they call traditional masculinity. And they describe traditional masculinity not as a set of characteristics that are you know, inherently male. They describe them uh, characteristics like stoicism, high achievement or trying for high achievement, competitiveness and aggression. Uh, they describe all these characteristics not as, well, this is how boys are, but as an ideology, an ideology that is known as traditional masculinity. To me, when I saw that, I said to myself, well, to psychologists, traditional masculinity is basically what the deplorables are to, to politics. They don't like the way boys and men are, and they assume that these qualities are part of an ideology rather than, okay, boys are more physical than girls. They're more aggressive. They're more stoic. Yes, that's true. They're more achievement-oriented or, or uh, aggression-oriented, competitive. Yes, certainly very competitive. All these qualities 
we find them to be wonderful when we need firefighters to run up 30 or 40 or 50 floors of a burning building and we think they're wonderful when the titanic's going down and you know it's women and children first or when they're in combat in defense of our country we like these qualities of competitiveness and stoicism and aggression and all that but the apa the american psychological association isn't thinking of all the good things that men do when they look at men all they can see is a problem a problem for women a problem for homosexuals a, a problem for transgender people you know they see them as kind of a, a problem that needs to be fixed in terms of their general characteristics it reminds me of a few things if i may i mean first of all thank you for for giving us that summary it reminds me of the fad which i suppose still continues of saying that young kids especially young boys have attention deficit disorders, put them on Ritalin, medicate them instead of letting them go outside, run around and be active and, and have physical education to try and say, well, that's an ideological problem or a medic being male is an ideological problem. Being boys is an ideological or a medical problem. And to call it ideological is to imply that it's, it's not natural and it's a, a, a choice and a negative choice this seems similar. Tell me what you think of this. There's this new attempt to normalize being super fat. This fat <laughs> acceptance, this put a super fat model on the cover of a magazine. As a fat person, I often dread medical appointments because of blatant medical fat phobia. Um, the last OB appointment I went to, uh, the provider blamed everything on my weight and told me that I needed to go on medication. That made me feel really terrible. This OB appointment that I just went to, I've been dreading, and the provider was amazing. She asked me what my pronouns are. To normalize through changing beauty standards what is unhealthy and faking it, saying, no, that's just as healthy, that is the ideology. And saying that masculinity is a problem that needs to be fixed feels as fake as saying being fat's totally cool and totally healthy, guys. I agree that all these things in extremes, uh, they're not good for society, they're not good for men. But the APA is not saying that these are bad when they're extreme. They're saying basically that they're bad in themselves, but they can be changed because we're all socially constructed, right? Mm -hmm. So all we have to do is recognize that we've been socially constructed in a bad way and change it. Basically, I think what they would like is for men to become more like women. So nonsense can become established scholarship and exclusion of ideas can be uh, is also a norm. And I think that Paris culture of the past 30 years, 40 years is also harm. The postmodern attack on credibility on truth and so on. And it's interesting to see how the sciences and the humanities reacted to that. In the sciences, it did attack the sciences. Mm -hmm. Ridicule, books, things like Alan Soko, yeah. Yeah. books like good, dangerous illusions, you know. But Bruno Latour, historian of science, argued at one point, somebody had written an article claiming that you could show that one of the pharaohs died of tuberculosis. And he wrote an article ridiculing this thing. Tuberculosis is a social construct, wasn't invented to it. But in the humanities and social sciences, it becomes a major phenomenon. And now, to pick up on that, there are been books written, as you probably know, arguing that postmodernism has morphed. And in fact, whether you want to call critical race theory something real or not, this notion, for example, of embedded oppression and white supremacy as part of scholarship overall is, is, is naturally meshes with the postmodern notion of, of oppressive ideas and ex refusing to accept objective reality. If everything is just power and bias, so what's the debate? Yeah, exactly. Close to that, like Foucault, for example. To go back to your original point, the creation of a culture on campus where you're afraid to open your mouth, even the idea of safe spaces, trigger warning, as if somehow we have to ensure that young people never hear anything that makes them think and disturbs them. This should be just the opposite. College is a time when you're 
thinking about things you never wanted to think about before. When your ideas are being challenged, when you challenge them yourself, that's education. Well, I've often said the purpose of science, but I think more generally of education is in some sense to make you uncomfortable because if you're comfortable, then you're really not learning. But in the sciences is teaching what they were teaching five years ago, either their brain did or their field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's see. The next question is in the best, this is an interesting question. I'll see if you, what you think about it. In the best of all possible worlds, what should a true academic debate look like? And what should academics have to tolerate in order to have one? In my entire time in the academy, I started graduate school in 1987. I have always loved the game. And the game is sort of like tennis, like someone hits a ball, someone says, or a philosopher or a book, you know, asserts something, you know, they hit it to you and then you hit it back. And either, you know, you say, you know, yes, or you say like, no, and here's why, or what about this? And then they hit it back. You go back and forth and it's a game. And you, you know, I guess you kind of want to win, but it doesn't really matter. Like you really want to, it's just fun to play the game. So that's one kind of game. And that's what you had in your more traditional philosophy course. And no one's views were sacred. You know, the professor in fact knows more than you, but you could catch the professor in a mistake or point something out that he hadn't seen. So that's the game that we know. And a different game had been nurtured in certain departments of the university all along, certainly since the 1990s. And that was more the activist game, which has sort of as many people as John McGuire has been arguing, he was one of the first to say that wokeness is a religion. So there's kind of an activist game. We're, we're here to fight evil and we have certain key thinkers who are our gods and we treat them with reverence and respect and we worship their words and we are on a noble mission. And philosophy doesn't do that well. If you take that into the philosophy classroom, it's just bizarre. But you put your finger on exactly what it was. It was more of a church-like atmosphere. It was more of a, well, you tell me, is it, looking back on it, now that you know everything you know, would you add anything to that analysis? My firsthand experience taught me on top of all those critiques was that it was a boring environment. It was actually, yeah. there was, it, it's like all, all these kids who, I was, I was actually very curious what they were thinking. And the reason I was curious is because no one raised their hands to say what they were thinking. There would sometimes be two to three comments toward the end of an hour and a half lecture class. And they would be very timid and just, you know, sort of cautiously agreeing. And I was so curious what people thought because we were discussing fascinating ideas, right? Like if Foucault is right, that is, that is a radical, it's, it's, it's the kind of idea someone has when they're on LSD or mushrooms. And it's, it would be super fun to bounce it around. Um, but there was no bouncing. And, and that's really what struck me most is that why aren't the kids complaining that this culture makes it more boring? Tell me about humor. Um, was there, looking back on your education, were there jokes, were there professors who made jokes where there was laughter in the classroom or was that not part of college for you? That's a good question. Um, I would say there was not that much humor that I can recall. Um, occasionally you would have it from, from like the first professor that I, I discussed. She, she, was, she could be funny sometimes. TikTok, a blight against human society. The more TikTok becomes popular in America, the lower the IQ seems to get with the people. Who was the first person to land on the sun? Lance something, Lance. Lance, Lance Armstrong. Is <laughs> now I've seen many things on this site that have made me want to just give up on life or on America as a whole or the generation called Zoomers. But the things I've seen now have really actually triggered me for lack of a better word. Listen, TikTok is terrible. If you don't believe me, ask the FCC that's finally come out and said that Apple and Google should ban TikTok from the App Store. But it wouldn't matter anyway, even if they did do it, it would still be available on websites and people would download it. Due to privacy concerns, apparently China's really digging into your data. And frankly, Zoomers don't care, hell. Even young millennials don't care. I was talking to an ex-girlfriend, I was like, you know, they're collecting data with this. She goes, I don't care, let them have my data. Let them have it. <laughs> she has to watch her manifestation videos or else you have to live in reality. 
And that's just a, a prospect she can't take. This is the interesting thing to me. If you read a lot of the writing of the techno utopians, they're almost all libertarian or progressive. They share what Thomas Sowell calls the, the unconstrained vision of human nature. This is the John Lennon vision. Imagine there's no countries, imagine no gods, no possess, just all the people living life in peace. It'll be amazing. Knock down all the walls, just put people together. It'll be great. We're all wired into a survival trip now. No more of the speed that fueled the 60s. That was the fatal flaw in Tim Leary's trip. He crashed around America selling consciousness expansion without ever giving a thought to the grim meat hook realities that were lying in wait for all those people who took him seriously. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. But their loss and failure is ours too. What Leary took down with him was the central illusion of a whole lifestyle that he helped create. A generation of permanent cripples, failed seekers, who never understood the essential old mystic fallacy of the acid culture. The desperate assumption that somebody, or at least some force, is tending the light at the end of the tunnel. Welcome back at 525. Soon you may not be able to find TikTok in your app store. Federal Communications Commission is working to remove it from Google and Apple. The FCC chair accuses TikTok's parent company of accessing your personal information. This is based off of a new BuzzFeed report. Both companies would have to voluntarily comply with this request. The FCC does not have jurisdiction over internet-based services, but even if TikTok is removed from your app store, you'll still be able to download it from the website. That's the unconstrained vision that guided the French revolutionaries, the Russian revolutionaries. And then the opposite vision, Sowell says, is the constrained vision of human nature, which is more Sigmund Freud. It's more you know, Edmund Burke. It's just the idea that actually we do need constraints. We need structure and constraints, and if we don't have them, what comes out is our sexual and aggressive nature. So it's actually civilization. It doesn't repress us and make us bad. It actually gives us structure, it constrains us, and actually makes us good, it makes us do our duty, makes us uh, be law abiding, good to people. So the internet, I don't think there was any social conservative involved anywhere in the creation of the internet. It was a dream of progressives and libertarians. God bless them. You know, many of my friends are progressives and libertarians. And you know, what I've learned is it's really helpful to listen to all three of those groups, progressives, libertarians, and social conservatives. But if you take any one of them out of the mix, what the other two would build is not really fit for human habitation. And that's the internet that we have. Well, let's look at the reality of life for tech professionals. If you work a nine to five job that requires you to actually, you know, work, this might really screw with your day. Today was one of those days where you leave for work at 7 a.m. and you don't get back until past midnight. Day in the life as a 22 year old living in Chicago, working in tech. I left for work early for a 9 a.m. meeting that was conveniently canceled right beforehand. But luckily I got to the lobby and there were these eucalyptus towels waiting for me, which is really nice. And some fresh orange water, which I of course took before taking the elevator up to the office. Let me, let me get this. Did I hear correctly? You come into work and they give you fresh eucalyptus towels. This isn't a job, it's adult daycare. Breakfast, normal oatmeal and chia seed pudding. And oatmeal and chia seed pudding. Have you ever heard of chia seed pudding? I haven't. I don't know what Chia C is. I've heard of Chia Pets. We finally got LinkedIn mugs in the office. You know she's enjoying her job because she has time to make this stupid TikTok and smile and like really exaggerate her eyebrows. Like, look at my job. Oh, it's just so goddamn insipid. As a man who used to work in a warehouse and I'd have to be up at three in the morning as paying for my mother's house and I was riding my aunt's scooter because my motorcycle couldn't handle going through snow because it had a shield, right? I was riding through weather that was literally, it was 10 degrees outside. So you're freezing your ass off. That's not my problem. It's yours. Is having eucalyptus towels with a side of fruit. There's no level of stress here, none. One part of the internet that I've often felt is a good thing 
is the flip side of the fragmentation problem. You use this analogy of the Tower of Babel and it comes down and everyone's speaking a different language. No one can understand each other, which is you know, a, a great analogy for what social media feels like. Everyone is in these tiny echo chambers and bubbles. Even my podcast audience that sees my tweets and sees follows related podcasts is part of a much smaller world than most people realize. The insight there is people think the bubble that they're in is, is much larger and more representative than it is. And everyone's in a bubble and the bubbles have multiplied and the bubbles are get they get smaller every day. The news you consume gets more linked to your sub, sub, sub culture. Mm -hmm. And all the other sub, sub, sub cultures make no That's sense right. to you because they you know, it were, would have required so much buy-in and years of context understanding that you can't possibly have had. So, so that's the fragmentation problem. But it seems like there's a flip side to that, which is the more subcultures there are, the easier it is to find a subculture where you really fit. So oh, how, right. do you, how do you, how do you right. think about the pros and cons of the fracturing <clears throat> of culture? That is a great observation. I'd love to answer this, to address this, because I've, I've got notes in my Evernote. I have all kinds of ideas for essays I want to write someday. And one of them is called something like the moral progress essay or the moral progress we lost in the 21st century. First, let's imagine two worlds, one of which there is a single story, everybody shares it, and that's all there is. There's one big community, we all share the same narrative, and, and it's all one community. This sounds kind of like a fascist dream. This is like not a human society. Let's imagine another where it's just fragments. Everything is with small groups and you can find a small group. You can move from group to group, but you know, it's just lots of small groups. And that's what we have now, fragmentation. This is the post babel world that we have now. And I think what, what I think is the most humane world, which was actually the, the liberal fantasy. And by liberal, I don't mean left. I mean, the like John Stuart Mill, you know, experiments in living. We want a liberal society is one in which we use minimum force on people and people can live the way they want but we still have a sense of community. We have shared meanings. We have shared facts. Like what job is this? You don't post stuff like this. In the middle of like a recession, isn't America wild? You know, you see videos like this on TikTok where it's like some, you know, she's a liberal, you know, she's completely out of touch with reality because her life is wonderful. And then on other TikTok videos, I'm watching people rob stores and buildings burn and a girl show her butt cheeks. Like TikTok is terrible. They should ban it. I feel like I'm in a never ending welcome to the jungle music video. There weren't that many people there, but listen to them sing Mamma Mia. I got nothing for that one. Did they literally just have a video conference to sing Mamma Mia? Did I really just see that? Dude, this video, it's toxic. This is the most toxic thing I've ever seen. It's terrible. This channel needs to be banned. And I said channel, I mean hers. This is bad. I'm hurting from this video. I would rather deal with puppy and kitten self pronouns. That looks delicious. Anyways, we love that song. We grabbed some lunch because we were starving after that. There I want you to just really focus on that. They had to have their lunch because they were exhausted after a meeting singing Mamma Mia. I'm sure some work was done, but it had to be very, very light. Because there's no way you move from singing Mamma Mia to like, four co-workers died in a cafe mocha latte accident or something. There was this cool little dish, and I grabbed a chai latte before heading to work. Oh, a chai latte. Right before going back to work. My God, it's like she's in a coal mine. Oh, and now they play ping pong. Fantastic. Watch some of my co-workers play ping pong. You know, why does LinkedIn exist? I now dislike LinkedIn with a white hot passion. And then tried out a new quiet room, which is a really nice area to just like relax and unplug from work. What work was done? I needed to unplug from my Jamba Juice. I had a little too much sugar and I had to come down from the high. This is terrible. This is so toxic. You know, there's never been, a, I don't think there's ever been a history, a period, a 50 year period in the history of any country in human history that had as much moral progress 
as much progress on these issues that progressives would care about, that everyone should care about, as those 50 years, my first 50 years of life. And then since 2012, and as I say in the essay, that's really when everything turned around. 2011, 2012 is the high point of techno democratic optimism. And it's that point that social media begins to fragment everything. And there's a lot more to the backstory. It's not just social media. Cable news, it plays a big role in polarization. There are a lot of other factors. But the technology really begins turning us all against each other and allowing room for these, these sort of bizarre, not bizarre, but these sort of moral ideas that are corrosive, that are incompatible with liberalism, incompatible with progress. They come in and then everything reverses. That's leading me to the thought, and, and this is, I suppose, the first time I'll, I'll, I'll air this, I think talking to you is a good place. My hypothesis is that gay marriage was the last, will be the last successful rights revolution. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because it's the last rights revolution that was fought by persuasion. Work was finally over, it was hot as hell, so we went to go get some drinks. And After a hard day of work, it's time to go have fun. Am I right, guys? You know, when I see people like on Twitter and stuff that are just like, let the asteroid come, I often think, wow, that's such an whole thought, you know, like, I think the world sucks. We should all die. But after seeing this, it's starting to make sense to me. Went to West Loop and went to Federale's really quick drink. At this point, I realized that I was still out with my work laptop. So I decided to call it a night. Good night. This is why America is so garbage. I'm sorry. Because we have 22 year olds that have jobs like these and they literally have no stress whatsoever in their life. And then when someone says something about them, like, Oh, those shoes are ugly. Or, I'm sorry, I didn't remember your pronouns, Zzer. And then they just have this meltdown. They just start screaming online. Oh my God! <laughs> you know, it's because they live like this. That they just, I can't, dude. I can't. This, I'm not watching the other videos. Maybe on a different day, I'll watch those videos. <laughs> but I'd rather, I would rather lay bricks than watch these videos. And I'm not playing. China needs to be stopped. And in fact, this chick posted it. Like, people are gonna love this. People working miserable jobs are gonna love my TikTok today about how leisurely today was. This was an adult daycare video. No, I'm out, I'm done. Get banned. <laughs> Emerson on one side, he says, we appreciate the past because it's this immaculate pedigree and it's been proven and it's, what do you call it? It's no ephemeris. It's, it's real. It's something we see and we feel and we know when someone is, you could say, virtuous or honorable. And I don't mean that in either a Christian sense or a moral sense. I mean that in a philosophical sense. Uh, but that question of, you know, how to treat the children, because I remember even my dad, he was regretful that he didn't have more kids. He's like, man, I could have had more workers because, you know, he was itching to put me to work from an early age. And he did. And I mean, I learned a lot, but. What kind of work did you do, if you don't mind me asking? Construction, demolition, you know, all sorts of stuff. Nietzsche talks about punishment and cruelty a lot, and you see it in parents, and you see it in children too. But I remember when I was a kid, and we'd be on the road, and we'd be in a truck, and this beat-up trailer on the back hauling crap, and he'd point to another junk junker vehicle and another, you know, towing a trailer or whatever the case may be, and he'd he just laugh and he'd go like, "Look, there's our people," and I'd get mad and I'd be like, "No, I don't want to. This is not what I want to do with my life. These aren't my people." And he would just laugh and laugh as I got mad. Mm. You know, talk about cruelty. The way that young Americans, I would say both of our generations, come up is with this deep, almost unconscious reverence for the style of the civil rights movement. The protest that is noble in its aims that eventually wins. That's right. And we don't even realize how much that paradigm has an effect on us until you, you know, speak to someone from China. That deep psychological imprint culturally is not a default that's a particular paradigm we have that what it means to be a good person or a lot of what it means to be a good person is to band together with people fight the oppression of a vulnerable group of people and win in the way that martin luther king did or perhaps even go further and be more radical however you want to do it but there are not an infinite number of issues on which that exact paradigm makes sense and, you know, gay marriage, it made a lot of sense. It's like, you go out and do a peaceful protest and persuade people, and then you want, you win. With the issue of trans, we are running up against a more complicated issue with trade-offs. It's like, where 
we're witnessing Western European countries like Finland, which we hardly see as backwards or bigoted places. In fact, we usually praise their approach to healthcare. We're seeing them phase out puberty blockers yeah, puberty for blockers. Yep. for kids under 18, which at the very least, one has to acknowledge this is not as morally clear cut as an issue like gay marriage or or voting rights for, for all races. And obviously those didn't seem clear cut at the time, but really the arguments for them are, are very straightforward. They don't involve these trade-offs. And I think you're possibly right. I mean, it's quite possible that we have reached the end of the issues on which that deeply conditioned hero's quest makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's right. And that would be a direct consequence of the post Babel era, the idea of, of once the Tower of Babel fell, we should just point out for listeners who don't remember the key line. The key line of the Tower of Babel story is after the people build this tower, the city in a tower and God is offended by the hubris. God says, let us go down and confound the, and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another. Mm -hmm. And so that's the metaphor I used in my article is that it's like, you know, it's like social media did this to us, destroyed the tower, no possibility of shared meetings anymore. All these micro communities of strangers, temporary strangers, little bubbles uh, in the ocean, no overarching, no possibility of a shared story, shared meaning, shared understanding, shared facts and never will be again. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, maybe in 100 years, but not in the next 10 or 20. We're not going to have shared facts and shared understanding in the next 20 years. And so if that's the case, then there is no possibility of a successful rights revolution anymore because you can't possibly persuade 80% of the people. You mm -hmm. can, you of can persuade 20% yeah. and, you, and if you're very aggressive about it, you're just going to then create enemies. So the further harder you push in a post babel world in a country defined by negative partisanship, but we don't vote for the person we want, we vote against the other side because we hate them so much. The, the harder you push on a rights movement here, you can get 20 or 30%, but that's just gonna cause the other side to be dead set against you. And I think that might be the future of rights movements in this country. I think most people who go into teaching, they, they really do want to teach and encourage learning and encourage education, but they're doing it in a system which is at working actively working against them. Right, because it's not, truly to especially in the enlightenment value sense it's not truly meant to liberate everyone it's not truly meant to educate anyone it's meant to elevate anyone who can be elevated within the system because then they will go on to bigger better things like to go to university is to be i'll use modern terminology even though i you know generally don't you go to a university to be a part of the one percent not to criticize and attack the one percent it's like what do you think you're doing there you know, like, oh, you're there to either fight the system or tear down the system. It's like, dude, you're part, you're in the system right now. You're advocating on behalf of the system, whether you realize it or not. There's a side to it all that you see the pull in more liberal academia, where the pull is towards, again, a very weird, modern subset, you know, I guess you could say remainders or offshoots of enlightenment values and you know liberal democracy and christianity primarily because that's what the morality all is right the morality of all of the if anyway if it's not clear i mean i'm sure you get where i'm going with this that we're talking about the people in this country who are from the top who criticize the top or pretend like they got out of the business or that they washed their hands of it so to see like the wealthiest and most protected and privileged members of a class of a system within the system hiding in the system hiding in these behind these walls criticizing everyone else not only that they're holier than thou but as if it's just a really weird thing to see not, it's not a weird thing because I think we were always headed here, but to see it manifest in real time, it's almost, it makes the past seem like just a strange dream. You know, and I'm talking about the, the resentful attitudes that are kind of inherent in a decadent country like America because founded in not just Christianity, not just democracy, the, the worst parts of it are revolution and slavery and not to the degrees that I guess part of our history, that's fine. It's not to, it's the Nietzschean understanding that there's no end to the great revolution. It's going on in this country now. It's been going on in France for years. So you see all these big countries that revolt. It's like once they revolt, that seed is there and then that resentment just comes full circle. Blake has a interesting, he says, the hand of vengeance found the bed to which the purple tyrant yes. fled. The iron hand crushed the head and came a tyrant in its stead. And that tends to be a pattern that we see again yes. and again. It's still this fundamental problem. For instance, I mean, one of the things that you talk about in Fools, Frauds and Firebrands is 
the idea of power being the the way in which everything is articulated the the mm. critique is about power i mean foucault is a good example of yeah. that of somebody who just saw everything in terms of power but there's definitely truth embodied in that and i think that's why it's so seductive for so many people yeah. i mean we have to deal with with the fact that so many people are seduced by this because they experience especially marginalized and disenfranchised people in a country like america i think of how much dysfunction we have here how much mental illness i've i've suffered this all my life that at least ever since i became a conservative in which was in may 1968 in, in paris. paris yeah yeah and i didn't know i hadn't a very clear idea of how to articulate it all i knew was that when i looked down the street and saw all these rowdy students throwing stones at policemen, I, I just said to myself, whatever they believe, I believe the opposite. Right. And then I didn't know what it was. And then it was a sort of lifetime's work to find out what the opposite is. Uh, and I, somewhat arrogantly, came to the conclusion that if you start thinking about politics in an intellectual way, you are likely to be on the left because that provides a systematic solution, an answer to the questions, gives, puts it all in a system, and also gives you a rather dignified and self-congratulatory place in the system. But once you started thinking, if you think a bit harder and longer about it, you'll move back to what you would have been if you had never thought at all. You know, and that's my, that's my view as what, what an intellectual conservative is. It's someone who articulates the real reasons for not having reasons. Say that again. Someone who articulates the real reasons for not having reasons, mm. but just feeling and doing what's right. Right. That idea that it's very easy to destroy and tear down. And I think one of the things that's so tempting for many people, because the world is so troubling, to so many people and so many people suffer in this world and a lot of what the, the liberal left tends to, to rely on is that sense of indignation that a lot of idealistic people feel. But then when we look historically, when these people have gotten into power, they, they tend to really, really tear things down and don't <clears throat> give us yeah. a... Well, I think there's an explanation of this what Hegel calls the labor of the negative. Right. The initial instinct on the left is that negative instinct, that things are wrong and it must, they must be rectified. They can only be rectified, however, by the seizure of power. And so we're gonna seize power in order to rectify them. But once you've got the power, the negative is still there in your heart because it's driven you all along. You know, that's the thing which has inspired you. So you set about destroying things, punishing people. You find classes who are to blame, you know, the Jews, yeah. the bourgeoisie, whoever it might be, and you don't get out of that negative structure. Right. I feel, that's what I felt very strongly in 1968, you know, that, okay, of course there are things that are wrong in France, but there are also things that are beautiful and right, and you've got to, go through this and come back and rescue those things, which is much more important than destroying a few obstacles along the way. Right. To a small child, the reason he cannot do many things that he would like to do is that his parents won't let him. Many years later, maturity brings an understanding that there are underlying reasons for doing or not doing many things, and that his parents were essentially conduits for those reasons. The truly dangerous period in life is the time when the child has learned the limits of his parents' control and how to circumvent their control, but has not yet understood or accepted the underlying reasons for doing and not doing things. This adolescent period is one that some people, intellectuals especially, never outgrow. The widespread and fervent use of the word liberation in a wide variety of contexts is one of the signs of the adolescent belief that only arbitrary rules and conventions stand in the way of doing whatever we want to do. Yes, that is true. But of course, in the intellectual world, it's extremely corrupting to see things in this Foucauldian way. Instead of asking the question, is what H H Hamza saying true? I ask the question, you know, what power is advancing behind that? 
you know, you then disappear from the picture, right. and also what you've said disappears from right. the picture. Yeah. I'm not no longer engaging with you, I to thou, at all, right. because th without the concept of truth, there is no real engagement between people. All I am seeing is the power that's speaking through you. Of course, you can look at the whole of culture in that way, which is essentially what the postmodern curriculum is. Right. Taking one writer, one philosopher, one musician after another, and just talking about, you know, like uh, Susan McClary on Beethoven. This is uh, fantasies of rape speaking through right. this music. It's extremely boring after a while because it's totally well, mechanical. It's, it, it... According to this vision of the world, the problems of all sorts of individuals and groups, women, minorities, homosexuals, children, are to be solved by liberating them from the restraints of laws, rules, conventions, and standards. They are to be liberated even from the threat of adverse judgments by other individuals. We are all to be non-judgmental. It's a lens. I mean, I, one, mm. one of the things I say about critical theorists, that if it was a lens, that it might be useful sometimes to just yeah. peer through that lens, but it's a corneal transplant. <laughs> that's you know, and, yeah, that's and, a and good it metaphor, yeah. Yeah, it becomes the only way. Yes. And I've seen, one of the things that I've seen with students in my own teaching experience is I've had critical theorists in my classes, and whenever they raise their hand, I could almost verbatim tell them what they're going to say, yes. the response that they're going to give to whatever was said. Yes. And Well, then we need to understand why it is so seductive. Uh, that's my point. I, yeah. It troubles me how seductive it's been, and it also, I grapple in my own self with the amount of genuine injustice in the world yeah. that, that takes place on a daily basis. And, I mean, for instance, you know, their attacks on capitalism, to me, the corporate world today is so powerful. And to use a favorite term in, in, that, in that world is hegemonic. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea where monoculture becomes so imperious. Nietzsche's got this aphorism about something along the lines of the state as producer of the anarchist. They're reacting. Herbert Marcuse, who I, I'm not a fan of by, mm -hmm. by any stretch, but when, when I read some of his works, I was struck by real insights about things that were very troubling about American yeah. culture. One-dimensional man, yeah. this idea of a consumer and life as consumption and losing me. I mean, his solutions is a whole other problem. But, and this is something I think that's very seductive is that the critical aspect of Marxism and neo-Marxism it's always had a, a resonance in a lot of people. There's something very, very powerful about it. When you get to solutions and how we deal with these things, mm. we're in another realm. But if conservatives don't really address the real serious critiques yeah. uh, that are there yeah. about the status quo. Yeah, I think you're right. They have perhaps neglected those critiques. As I was saying earlier, the purely negative approach to the status quo is simply going to perpetuate this negativity and has done. The typical conservative in my reading of events is someone who looks around himself and he finds things that he loves, you know, and he thinks, well, those things are threatened, they're vulnerable, right. I've got to protect them. Right. And it's not often that you find on the left somebody who looks around and finds things that he loves. It's always something that's gone wrong something that is even hateful, and you've got to mobilize against it. If you've lost any sense that actually the world is lovable, and that there are things therefore to be rescued in it, you have actually lost the, the sense of why there is such a thing as a community in the first place. Mm. And that, I think, is one of the things that I felt very strongly throughout my life, that there really are wonderful things that we've inherited. All Americans, however, at whatever position in society they are, are still heirs to something rather remarkable. You know, a rule of law which just goes on perpetuating itself from generation to generation. If, they, if only people knew how rare that was, they would see that they've got a fight to preserve it. And the same with so many other institutions that we have Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, because again, the only reason we're having these conversations is because very intelligent and creative men a long time ago mapped out the spaces. And they figured out the language and they figured out how to relate it. And then our own education process is actually to tap into that because what's otherwise the point of having a culture and a civilization, but to promote it and educate people to live within it so you can survive.
Some of the painful consequences of various liberations that began in the 1960s have included the disintegration of families, skyrocketing crime rates, falling test scores in school, and record-breaking rates of teenage suicide. Sometimes bad things happen because of adverse circumstances, poverty or war, for example. But our post 1960s social disasters occurred during a long period of peace and unprecedented prosperity. One of the signs of maturity is the ability to learn from experience. Some of us have learned, and we have halted or reversed some of the adverse trends. Uh, in a country like America, I think of how much dysfunction we have here, how much mental illness. Within sex research in particular, I feel like sex research was the, the canary in the coal mine because we saw this coming decades ago in that uh, one professor, Michael Bailey at Northwestern University, there's been a long history that's ugly between sex researchers and transgender activists. And Michael Bailey wrote a book, I think it was 2003, the things that they did to him, some of them were very unethical and really, they really tried to ruin him professionally and, and his personal reputation as well. So after that, people said, well, you know, I'm not touching the subject because it's just not worth it. The students are being taught this and they graduate, they go out into the real world, they get jobs. And a lot of people, even five years ago, I would say dismissed a lot of this ideology, especially around gender. They would say, that's only in academia. That is not something that's actually going to affect me in my you know, real life. But here it is now, it's, it affects everybody. There's no way that you, this is not affecting you. I think it's just a question of how much do you pay attention to it? You know, people t send me messages. They tell me about when they have training at work, they tell me about their kids' education. Like at the book, I don't just talk about transitioning children. I talk about the idea that gender is not a social construct. It is not a spectrum. I talk about how it, there is a relation between gender identity and sexual orientation, which you're also supposed to not say, apparently. I talk about sex differences. These are all things that are considered taboo, and I don't understand. I don't understand why we can't just have a fact-based conversation. We're not saying that this information justifies discrimination against people. In fact, I'm always very clear to say that it doesn't. You're looking at this as a scientist, and you're looking at this as a person who is very frustrated by the fact that you can't discuss science, particularly when it comes to really critical aspects of people's lives, which is sex and gender. So there are two genders. And so gender, for 99% of us, our biological sex is our gender. Biological sex is determined by gametes, which are either eggs or sperm. So there are no intermediate gametes. So gender is either male or female. So th this I do not think invalidates the existence of intersex people or transgender people. I think we can advocate for equal rights for those communities. We don't have to reconceptualize what gender or sex are. And, and also for intersex people in particular, most of them want to live within the binary. They want to live as either male or female. They don't want they don't want gender or sex to be collapsed into uh, a, a kaleidoscope or a galaxy or whatever else. I mean, this is what's being published in scientific papers now. They refer to gender as quite literally a galaxy. So, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Not just a spectrum, but a galaxy. 250 oh, okay. billion kinds. types? <laughs> is that what it's like? <laughs> like all the stars? That's crazy. So the bad news is there's nothing in place to stop higher education from going further down the same road as America's teacher training institutions and public schools. And that's a disaster, not just for education, but for the nation as a whole. 10 ways that teaching has changed and not for the better. Number one, respect is gone. These days, teachers are viewed with suspicion. And a lot of times we feel guilty until proven innocent. Number two, uncooperative parents. These days, for whatever reason, parents are very confrontational and they question teachers just as much as the students do. Number three, there is a climate of fear. Parents are afraid of upsetting the kids. Teachers are afraid of upsetting the parents. Principals are afraid of getting in trouble with the superintendent. School districts are afraid of getting sued. Everybody's afraid of going viral for the wrong reason or ending up on the news. And all of this contributes to a lot of really unhealthy extremes. The issue of student discipline in schools is far more complicated than parents realize, is far more complicated than even teachers realize because if you write a discipline referral to admin, the assumption on the teacher's part is that admin will take care of it. And what happens when they don't? Why don't they? And there's a couple of very important things that need to be taken into consideration when it comes to student discipline. First of all, schools don't exist 
to discipline children. Schools exist to teach children. Families and parents, mentors, grandparents, uncles and aunts, they exist to discipline children. First and foremost, that's where discipline should and must come from. If parents were good at raising children with good behavior skills and good socialization skills, student discipline would be almost non-existent. So that's a given for me. Schools primarily shouldn't be disciplining children. And if schools have to discipline, they need to do so on that level. And that is when you disrupt the environment of the school. And to their credit, barring criminal activity, that's what most of the referrals to admin are. Disruptive classroom behavior, insubordination, dress code violations, truancy, that kind of thing. Well, truancy is actually breaking the law. So why don't they respond immediately? Well, that's because, and I am not defending admin because I think most admin don't respond to it because they simply don't like to. They're too lazy. But one of the things admin has to consider when disciplining a child is the law. First and foremost is in fact, what is the limit the law will allow in disciplining a minor? And that's one of the core issues here is because if admin goes too far, they can face a lawsuit that they will lose because while the laws and norms concerning the discipline of children by non-parental figures, such as teachers or anyone, the laws concerning the protection of our children in this country are actually quite strict and quite severe. But at the same time, they're also quite vague. And principals, admin, must side on the side of caution when disciplining students, because at the very least, you're gonna get very angry parents who can make things very, very difficult. And so they have to consider what is legally allowable that won't be misconstrued as child abuse. Leads me to number four, there is mountains of paperwork. Documentation is needed for absolutely everything and a teacher's word alone is not trusted. This leads to hours of extra work per week and it's frustrating because we know there's about a 95% chance that absolutely nobody is going to look at this, but just in case we need to have everything documented. Number five, creativity is gone. These days everything is highly regulated. Teachers have very little freedom, we're tightly micromanaged and controlled and gone are the days of doing an impromptu unit or project. Everything needs to be tied to a state or common core standard and it feels like nothing can truly be sheerly educational or enriching if it's not going to be somehow monitored or tracked by some kind of test. Number six, highly political. Things are changing so rapidly in our culture that teachers live in terror of accidentally saying the wrong thing and getting permanently canceled or worse, doxxed and attacked. There doesn't really seem to be freedom of discussion about things anymore, and there constantly tends to be an us or them mentality. Teachers are afraid to be themselves and believe what they believe if it lies outside of one party line or the other. And yes, there is an element of laziness that admin just doesn't want to deal with it unless they absolutely have to. And the ones they absolutely have to are the ones that cross a line into requiring legal action. But as any of you out there know, even those students get away with it most of the time as well. So there's that. There's laziness, there's the law, there's the backlash, and then there's prioritizing. All those initially come into play in deciding what student gets what punishment. But see, that leads to my next point of punishment. American schools, in the case of discipline, what they really mean is punishment. There are other forms of discipline like restorative justice, but other schools have tried it. A restorative justice, for those of you that don't know, it's a simple balancing of the scales. So let's say, let's say you're in elementary school, a boy teases a girl or another student or something like that, and he requires discipline. Restorative justice means the, the child has to now do something positive, either for the student or for the classroom, 
to balance the scales. But that really doesn't work in America because restorative justice only really, really works in cultures that are heavy on honor and shame, where you need to restore your honor, your good standing in the eyes of others, because what you've done has shamed them. It's not criminal. Without that honor shame dynamic, restorative justice doesn't work. It's like, oh yeah, I'll just do this, but their behavior doesn't change because there's no social consequence. There's no social kind of uh, shift in the way you're perceived because that's just not how America is. And so we punish and traditionally for many, many years, uh, America punished physically paddling, things like that, through putting on the dunce cap and sitting in the corner and becoming the mockery of students. And if you didn't want to become the mockery of students, don't misbehave. But whatever it was, whether emotionally or personally, physically, the idea was to inflict some sort of pain in order to correct the behavior. But all pain does is promote anger and resentment. But that's all America knows. When it comes to school discipline, in that regard, it's really no different than prisons. That's what prisons do. But corporal punishment from the Latin corpus, meaning body, bodily punishment has been the tradition of our country because we simply haven't tried anything else in its tradition. And admin has to be careful on how much bodily harm, a certain amount, or emotional harm disciplining a child has to do and keep in mind we live in a very kind of like socially politically sensitive environment and an admin has to take into consideration some things that teachers may not and that is if you got a white male principal and he's disciplining a uh, black female student well huh that's going to open up a whole can of worms because there's the sexist angle, there's the racism angle. Now, as you go up the progressive stack, if the student is, let's say you got a white, you know, cis male, heterosexual male in charge, which in today's environment is the enemy, I guess, and he's disciplining a black, female LGBTQ student, well, the consequences for him just have skyrocketed. Let's add one more layer of marginalization. Let's make her Black, female, LGBTQ, and she's on the autism spectrum. Now you have a personal disability. There's no way that principal is going to do anything to that student. He's a white man. You know, he's automatically going to be held at fault no matter what he does, simply because he's white, a male, and in charge. And so what happens is as you proceed up that, there's less and less a principal can actually do or will do without political backlash coming back on him. And while principals do get paid well, they don't get paid well enough to deal with that when it can be avoided. There's a very real socio-political ramification in who you discipline and how far. Now, if you go the other way and you have a school that's, let's say, inner city, largely black or Latino community, and you discipline a, a white student, we have cases in which they go too far that way. We have cases in which schools go too far in disciplining minority students and giving lesser punishment to white students for the same infraction. It's really, really difficult. And a principal worth his or her salt has to take that into account. They simply have to take that into account because it's a very real thing in our society that they will be accused of if you have yourself such a student. So if a cis white male heterosexual teenager gets disciplined, no one cares. But let's add to the progressive stack. You got a poor black female LGBT, LG, you know what I mean, on the autism spectrum, and she's the child of a single mom. Bro, do you have any idea how fast that story will hit the media and the media will twist it 
to make it seem like that school is being run by heterosexual Aryan males who are all grand wizards of the KKK. It's just something. So disciplining students is, you know, once a teacher signs it off and sends it to admin, they think it's a one and done. But admin really has to tread carefully. Now, ideally, everybody should be treated the same. But we don't live in an ideal world. And we certainly do not live in an ideal world now. And so admin must be very, very, very careful about who they discipline, why they discipline, and how far they go. And it's just easier for the minor stuff, you know, minor insubordination or stuff like that, just to not bother with it at all because it's not worth the backlash. And to prioritize the more serious infractions that may require legal action or legal investigation. But student discipline has traditionally be, been very difficult because originally that's not what schools were for. And I don't think that schools would, should still be for. I think discipline is first and foremost the responsibility of a parent. But again, given our current day and age, you know, good luck with that. Many, if not most colleges, are actively teaching students an inverted form of American exceptionalism. Not that the country is exceptionally virtuous, but that it's exceptionally evil. That's especially easy to do when only 11% of the nation's public high school graduates rate proficient in American history. Still fewer graduates are proficient in world history, which means that America's many failings are made more conspicuous for being completely stripped of any global historical context. Most students have no idea, for example, that slavery has been a worldwide practice almost from the beginning of recorded history and that it was the West which, even as it often supported and engaged in this horrific practice, also invented the principled opposition to it known as abolition. Nor did they realize that slavery was a problem in various parts of the world throughout the 20th century and even into the 21st, as the Global Slavery Index from the Walk Free Human Rights Group shows. 40 years ago, it was possible that a high school graduate who didn't know these things would discover them in college. It's more likely now, I'm afraid, that in most institutions, the student's ignorance will either be untouched or reinforced. Number seven, learning isn't really valued. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many wonderful things about the internet and Wikipedia and having all of the knowledge of the galaxies at our fingertips. But because of this privilege, knowledge is seen as so common that it's often completely disregarded. I think subconsciously, sometimes students think, why should I learn anything? If I need to know it, I can simply look it up. And there are all kinds of problems with that mentality, but we'll save that for another video. The teachers complain about their pay, one of the most common retorts I see online is teachers knew what they signed up for. It's like saying Frodo knew what would happen when he left the Shire. So let me paint this picture. I got hired and on the first day I got hired they handed me a piece of paper showing pay and scheduled raises. It honestly didn't look that bad and with pay going up with the cost of living, I could handle that. Not so fast. For the first four years my pay was frozen due to their lack of funds. Then when our pay became unfroze we were told our last four years of raises we should just let it go. Then, in my fifth year of teaching, the state government decided to take 3% out of each and every paycheck for the retirement package that they mismanaged and now need help recouping the funds for. You know, that retirement that I was told was part of my package. So then five years into teaching, my take-home pay is actually less than the first day I started. Then came the money for class supplies. For years, we got a check that covered the cost of some supplies within our classroom. But then they started giving the check to an outside for-profit company and putting all these restrictions on what we could and couldn't buy for our class. I bought an electric pencil sharpener for my classroom, which they said wasn't allowed because they deemed it furniture. So they took the funds out of my paycheck to cover the cost of the pencil sharpener, but refused to put the funds back into the electronic account so that I could get more supplies. And the funds they took from my paycheck, they just used to pay bills, not buy supplies. Wish I was lying. Which, side note, that same for-profit company that we use just got a contract in Idaho to handle $50 million in funds for low-income families. By the way, at a cost of $2 million of those funds. I think the families would rather have the money. Back to the steps. Each year I was employed, they never even gave us the steps on the first day anyways. They just held the funds the full year and then just collected the interest on our money. The one year they did give us a raise, they gave us $900. Great! And then increased the cost of insurance for a spouse by $1,200. Then they froze our steps again 
in at the time that the stock market was making record gains. The best economy we've ever seen and teachers pay is frozen. Unless you were a superintendent, then you got your raise. Twice the district raised the starting pay of new teachers in order to lure them in, but they reduced the step increases for the veteran teachers to cover the new teachers. Never actually offering more money, just squeezing a balloon, leaving veteran teachers feeling deflated. Literally. The most recent time they did this, not only did they suggest lowering the steps for the veteran teachers, but they suggested actually reducing the pay for the support staff. That's right, the governor actually signed a deal to get us more money that resulted in support staff getting paid less? Now what about pay for performance? We did have that for a while. Most recently you had to have great evaluations, good test scores, oh, and your entire school had to have an overall 3% gain. Guess what? No matter how great of a teacher you were, over 40% of the schools in the state didn't even qualify for a bonus. Even recent emergency COVID funds that were sent directly by the federal government have been put away by the district for a rainy day fund. Gee, let's hope that rainy day comes soon. Maybe we can paddle out and meet it through these floodwaters. So to sum it up, the sheet they handed me on the first day, complete lie. Yet this sheet is still published online for incoming teachers as if it actually means something. My pay was frozen 60% of the time that I worked. Not once was a step given when it was supposed to be. The state took money they just mismanaged. And the only people seeing raises were the people that worked at the district office and the for-profit companies that were milking your tax dollars dry. By the way, this is only addressing the topic of pay for teachers. Respect and well-being, completely different video. Oddly enough, usually met with the same response. They knew what they signed up for. Number eight, students are out of control. As many of you have brought to my attention, there has always been youthful rebellion. But I think there's something about the colliding of popular culture and social media that has turned this rebellion into an out of control monster that can't be put back in the jar. I'm sure all of you guys have already heard about all of the different TikTok channels that folks focus on harassing teachers or destroying school property. But let's just say that social media and technology are not being used for the betterment of education. Number nine, there is a little to no discipline for unruly students. I've already done a few videos about this, but in many instances, teachers feel like they have to have a mile long list of documentations and interventions and strategies they've tried <laughs> and everything else under the sun before a student can get a simple consequence. And because of Number two, uncooperative parents. Even with all of those things, it's very common that parents are gonna push back against any attempt to discipline their child. And finally, number 10, we have unstable methodologies. I started teaching in 2013 and every year there's a new trend and it often contradicts the thing that we were being told the year before. So one year there might be a huge push for authentic text, so everybody says novels are in. And then the next year it's novels are out, we need short reading passages, that focus on test prep strategies. All of the instability makes it really hard for teachers to feel like they're getting time to master their craft. And even worse, when we feel like we finally did master something, then we just know it's gonna get taken away or changed the next year. Now, as a reminder, these are generalizations. I know that all of these 10 things are not true for every school or every district. And I know that certain regions of the United States are different, some parts of the world are different. But overall, a lot of these changes are things that I have I've heard from teachers all over America and all over the world. All of these things are combining with things that I've talked about in other videos, and it's making people leave the teaching field in mass numbers. What the hell is that? The unproductives. God damn it, how are there so many of them? Unproductives? Yeah, DJs, foodies, influencers. I just recirculate them through until... They blew a hole in the human resources department. You're fine. Yeah, I'm I'm putting this in your file. We gotta fix this, Dad. We can't keep recycling them through. I can add an online uh, college workaround. Or just push them out through a pipe in the back. Same, Same thing. thing. People can get attention either from their accomplishments or from their deliberate attempts to get attention. Today, almost everywhere you look, people seem to be putting their efforts into getting attention. Wild hairdos, huge tattoos, pierced body parts, outlandish clothing, weird statements. All these have become substitutes for achievements. Some parents give their children off-the-wall names as if that is the way to give them some kind of individuality. On the contrary, it means joining a stampede towards showiness. You don't need a crazy name to become famous. It would be hard to think of plainer names than Jim Brown, Ted Williams, Walter Johnson, or Michael Jordan. It was what they did that made their names famous. 
A lifetime of making major contributions to the health, prosperity, or education of a whole society will not get as much media attention as organizing some loud and strident demonstration spiced with runaway rhetoric. In a non-judgmental world, what is there to determine who deserves notice, except who can make a big splash? We not only live longer today, we are more vigorous in our 60s than earlier generations were in their 40s. But can you name even one person or one enterprise that conferred this enormous benefit on millions of people? The average American today has a standard of living that includes things that only the upper crust could have afforded in times past, and some things that even the rich didn't have in past generations, like personal computers. The problem is that the society at large no longer has standards by which to deny or rebuke attention seekers who have nothing to contribute to society. Do not expect sound judgments in a society where being non-judgmental is an exalted value. As someone has said, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. The state of Alabama in the midst of a teacher shortage before the pandemic, but recent studies have shown projections that could be much worse. Across the country, states, including Alaska, have difficulty keeping good teachers, principals, and superintendents in their positions, especially in remote parts of the state. While we love to celebrate great teachers in our community, Arizona is also in great need of teachers. And new bill at the legislature trying to address our teachers shortage. And here in Arkansas are busy dealing with an issue that started popping up during the pandemic, a shortage of teachers. There was already a teacher shortage crisis across California, but now the pandemic has made matters worse. Back here, so many Colorado school districts are dealing with a shortage of teachers. She's the executive director of the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents. Fran, thanks for being with us. Is this a, a problem for many of your members around the state? Absolutely. State of Florida, the growing shortage of teachers. And it's all part of a push to address a teacher shortage right here in Georgia. To the lowest paid teachers in the nation, this is a major factor in the Hawaii teacher shortage. A lack of teachers and substitutes has forced a South Central Idaho school district to shut down for more than a week. Quite a while, Illinois facing a teacher shortage. Schools here in Indiana are actually struggling to keep up and hire new teachers. The question tonight is how do we get more teachers into Iowa classrooms? For the Kansas City, Kansas School District, she says KCK, like other districts, has struggled. Kentucky must act soon to solve its teacher shortage or it could be facing a crisis. Teacher shortages continue to cause schooling, staffing problems in Louisiana and nationwide. More teachers are needed in nearly every department in nearly every school in Maine. President of the Maryland State Education Association says there's a nationwide teacher shortage, including right here in Maryland. Schools in Brockton and Lawrence had to close today, and Boston schools opened, but more than 400 teachers were out. In Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana. A nationwide teacher shortage could be threatening the future of agriculture in our state and beyond. Nebraska schools are struggling to fill agriculture education positions and say that we have a crisis on our hands. Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey. In classrooms across New Mexico, the National Guard taking up teaching posts during an education emergency. Does it say its name or does it say eh, pig? Service members in both uniform and civilian clothing substitute teachers during an unprecedented shortage of educators. New York's North Carolina, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma. Oregon says that the numbers are so bad now that they have to take people who are not necessarily qualified officially with degrees and certification and put them in the classroom. Oh, you better believe that's a bad one. Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Virginia. There are several factors contributing to the teacher shortage in Washington state. Low teacher pay, high number of teachers retiring. Schools across West Virginia are closed for fewer teachers in Wisconsin. The problem is, is that the pipeline behind them is not filled. The crisis of school funding in Wyoming. In a country like America, I think of how much dysfunction we have here, how much mental illness. Given the dysfunctional state of the American educational system and the damage ed schools continue to inflict, what can the ordinary citizen do? Hello, sir. I'm with the Gallup Poll. We're trying to get a read on how people will be voting in the upcoming presidential election. Oh, oh okay. Great. And will you be voting for the giant douche or the turd sandwich? Well, this is usually a giant douche household, but 
We are going firmly with the turd sandwich. Oh, the turd sandwich, huh? That's right. You can put my wife and I both down for turd sandwich. Well, good luck with that. So far, giant douche is leading in the polls. What? What the hell is wrong with people? They really think that a giant douche should be president? It's insane! Why'd you say I'd be voting for the turd sandwich, Randy? You haven't even talked to me about it. You can't possibly be thinking about voting for the douche! <sighs> What's wrong with you? I just don't understand why every four years you people freak out over whether to vote for a giant douche or a turd sandwich. Because we're Americans? Because this is America? Why are we doing this again? Why are we back to giant douche and turd sandwich? Cynical. Cynical man. You just think everything and everyone is dumb, huh? Because you're a nihilist. It's nihilist. See, you're such a nihilist. Newest Gallup poll results are in, and they show giant douche to be leading turd sandwich by nearly 10%. Leave a paper trail, ladies and gentlemen. Leave a paper trail. Always put it in an email, okay? Trust me. You won't regret it. <laughs> I know you're not leaving a paper trail, that's for sure. Reading all of these stories, you know, we f I feel like we felt every single one. There wasn't not one that's story cool. that I didn't relate with. That I wasn't like, oh, I've never heard of this happening. It's happening. It's happening all the time and everywhere. And, and it has to stop, but how, how is it going to stop? The problem is, exactly. is that there'll always be, and Brie hit on this too, is that there will always be someone else right behind you lining up to take your job. You know, she felt like she could die with the amount of stress that she was dealing with at that time. And she knew in her head, as all of us do, that school and the school is not going to stop if any of us die. They're just going to replace us with another person. You would think with education, with all that we do for the kids and all that we give up and all that we serve, that they would, you know, value our health and our and our well-being. And that's really not the case at all. And I think that's just, you know, as we end this episode, which is actually feels depressing now. But, no. you know, the matter of fact is that teachers are quitting and really good teachers are quitting. So what can people do to make schools a better place? How can we fix this education system? I'll tell you one thing. We need to start with principal school. <laughs> Admin school? That place sucks. We also need a lawmaker school, apparently. <laughs> yeah, we need a lawmaker school. It's trash. Principal school, trash. We need to just, we need to revamp the whole thing. I don't know what is going on. Thank you guys for tuning in for this uh, super depressing episode. We thought it was going to be like kind of amazing, but we're kind of depressed after after having this discussion, but we appreciate you guys for sticking with us. What they failed to do with me, it looks like they successfully did with everyone else, and that was to put them in learning disability class. That's what I think of when I think of American education. They can't seriously expect us to swallow that tripe. Now as a special treat, courtesy of our friends at the Meat Council, please help yourselves to this tripe. <laughs> Apparently, my crazy friend here hasn't heard of the food chain. Yeah, Lisa's a grade A moron. <laughs> when I grow up, I'm going to Bovine University. <laughs>